I say there are two types of yoga. There are more than two types of yoga, but I say there are two types of yoga. There's nuts and bolts yoga, and there's rainbows and unicorns yoga. The yoga that like, you're stretching your bicep, you're stretching your tricep, this is elevating your blood pressure, you're releasing CO2 more slowly. There's science behind the yoga. It's not like this woo-woo that yoga sometimes get a stigma for. And then there's the rainbows and unicorns, the chakras, the panchakosha, the subtle body stuff. So the town got very aware of there's this group of people who are moving in. And on the one hand, in a lot of ways, it was a cult. And on the other hand, people really overreact to everything. Yeah, so the com the combination of both of those things, Damn. they're freaking out. There's a concerned citizens group that are meeting, you know, weekly. What are we going to do about the people of hope? Well, as it turns out, we were on Channel 4 News, NBC, ABC. We were on all the major news networks. As a scandal. My, as a, like, sort well, of, like uh, as a cult, oh, like geez. taking over Berkeley Heights, New Jersey. And I didn't even get to tell, talk to the audience about how much I've loved taking your classes. Because it's been, it's been a minute, but, you know, definitely you're a popular instructor. Thanks, <laughs> you're the class, you'll fill up the class. And I got to say, uh, you are able to hold a space that feels like sacred and playful at the same time, which is like a really hard combination to pull off. And you're Thanks. funny and you're genuine, you know, it comes through yeah, I think in, your, in your teaching a lot. Anyway. I feel my strongest point of my teaching is authenticity. Yeah. I'm not teaching you like, oh, I'm your yoga teacher. I'm like, mm -hmm. hey guys, let's jump in the pool and splash around. Mm -hmm. And I think that resonates with people. And I just feel blessed that people love what I'm doing. My, my mom actually found rock music. I had in the middle drawer of my desk, I had a fake bottom oh my and you goodness. popped it up. And she found James Taylor and Billy Joel. I got in all <laughs> sorts of trouble. Of That's, all things to find. Right, of all things, right. Not that bad. Right, now I think of it, it sounds so hysterical, but it was a big deal at the time. Sure. But anyway, couldn't listen to rock music going to this high school. Couldn't date. You weren't allowed to date until you were 18. Yeah, we had the now same they, role. They did not yeah, have arranged marriage. Time. When I realized, and the joke I say is, I realize when I do yoga, when I'm done with yoga, I'm a nice person mm. for maybe 10 extra minutes. <laughs> I'm not that long. Well, I know, I know. Sometimes, sometimes it was an hour or mm -hmm. a few hours. Sometimes it was an entire night. Yeah. I saw a direct yeah. correlation to the days that I practice yoga and then I don't. And then when you throw in the breath work and meditation, and to me, those things are very crossover. Most yeah. people try to get into meditation and they can't. Start with breath work. It's, it's your better friend. It's something you're doing physically. A lot of meditation, yeah. people try to do nothing. It's like, yeah, good luck. Yeah. Choose something that's better than the mind racing, which is focus on the breath, count the breath, listen to the breath, whatever you're gonna do with the breath. But the breath is a big part of it. But yeah, just using those tools to help you be a more effective person. And then I was finding for myself, well, if it's making me a better person, if I can be a decent person, and this direct correlation between the days I practice and don't practice, I really was like, that's when I wanted to share it with other people. I'm like, if it can help me out, it, it, it can help other people out. And you know, I'm still a normal person. That's why I say, am I a yogi? I'm a really normal person that uses the tool of yoga to make me a better person. And I share that with other people. That's what I do. It's like, I don't know if I'm, I'm definitely not a guru. I'm not like, I eat meat, I drink Diet Coke. Yes. You know, I mean, I'm not I, like, I do eat healthy, wholesome foods as well. Yeah, hopefully. Like the basis, <laughs> the basis of my diet is healthy food, mm -hmm. but I'm, I'm not like a vanilla person. Do you think that there is a meeting crisis right now? Do you think there is that people are struggling to find? I do, especially that? I think with the blow up on social media, okay. media and entrepreneurship and things like that. Mm. Like. I think a lot of people now have a lot of pressure to find meaning to why. Like, what's my why? That's a big question. And I do think, I think those are effective tools. I think it's good to ask, like, what do I want to promote? What do I want to do with myself? Mm. But I think if you, if, you, if you start with, like, what do I believe in? What does this all mean for me? Um, it can help guide you in that direction. I do think that like some people are putting a lot of pressure to find like that game winning meaning on their life that may or may not be for them. 
but they see other people doing it and they feel like, oh, that's what I need to do now. Like, I need to be an influencer. In the yoga world, there's a lot of people on social media feeling really bad about themselves because they don't have a, a good following. Favorite musical? I mean, Hamilton was mm. freaking incredible. If I was gonna say like a musical that's been around forever, I was a big fan of Jesus Christ Superstar. That's my favorite. Because. Oh my God, it's been again. <laughs> my because favorite ever. It, it deals with a story that you and I both yes. know, and it was a different take, take on out. the whole thing. Yeah. And I think probably a more realistic take on the whole thing. I agree. I, like I was in a want... production of it. In oh, school. that's so cool. Oh, Soldier number Soldier number three. That's great. That's <laughs> but great. I love that. Musical. I saw that meditation is good just to quiet the mind. Meditation is also good, and here's where, you you know, it gets a little bit in a prayer. If I'm trying to quit smoking and I meditate for 10 minutes every morning, what am I doing? I'm praying to something saying, please don't, don't make me smoke. Maybe what I'm doing is thinking of the times where I know I'm gonna wanna smoke. And I preemptively, I'm saying, when this happens, here's the behavior I'm gonna choose. When I get this feeling, instead of doing this, I'm gonna do that. So if I'm not trying to clear my mind and find stillness in meditation, it's like, planning for the game. It's like pulling up my playbook and saying, here's are the plays, the plays I'm gonna pull out. When I'm dealing with this like way of behavior, like this lashing out of anger or whatever, how do I reset that? So that as I move through my day, when it comes up, I'll, oh, here's that thing I was, pl I was planning in the quiet of my own thoughts earlier today. If I don't plan it in the quiet of my own th thoughts, it surprises me every time and I don't take the action I wanna take. I had this real epiphany about religion, probably in my high school years, where I'm like, as sure as my, let's say my parents are, that they are doing God's will and they are right with God, they are doing things the right way, the Muslims feel the exact same way, mm. the Jews feel the yeah. exact same way, yeah, yeah, yeah. the Krishnas, the Mormons, they all think right. that they are doing <laughs> things yeah. wholeheartedly, mm -hmm. without a doubt, so what is that? And I say, well, there is the through line. And I ultimately equivalent it to, let's talk about most of the major religions. I think it, the essence of most of the major religions are try to come from a place of love, don't hurt people, don't kill people, do the right thing. The meaning is we're here having the experience. Anything past that, serve society and have fun while you're doing it. And it's that simple, mm. but we put a lot of pressure on ourselves to make it like look shinier and, and better. Yeah, I like the way you put it, a game-changing meaning. Yeah. I think there is. They wanna find the unicorn. On the interview that I was watching with you today, and you asked him to share about his transcendent experience, and he's like, it's really hard to define, and that's the thought that came to my mind. The moment, like, I've had those moments where I saw the universe. I really, really feel like, call me crazy, but I really feel like that I have. And I could explain some of it, but really what I can't explain is that it's here, I'm here, this is happening, it's now. This is all things, this is everything. And you're like, what does that even mean? It's like, if I try to explain it, it's not gonna make any sense anyway, except that it's a feeling of just be. This, it took me years okay. to get here. I can really move and connect with breath, body, and mind, and have that be the only thing going on in my life. The joke I make is no romance, finance, and circumstance as you're moving through your yoga practice. Yeah. Those things you're not thinking about, oh, my taxes are due in a month and I haven't called up my tax attorney, right? You're in chair pose and you're like, oh, this is really hard. That's a gift, mm -hmm. you know? And, and, and when you use that gift, it can really simplify things for your average individual. Mm -hmm. So have I had transcendent moments? To me, that's it. Just this like, they say that uh, musicians and dancers have this gift. When you play music, why are you playing music? Not to get to the end of the piece or else everyone will play the music as fast yeah, as possible. Right, right. right, when you're dancing, where are you trying to get? Nowhere, you're moving your body. So in those two examples, it's about having the experience. And I think this is life. Yes. It's about having the experience. Yes, you're like, yes, yes. You, you want a miracle? You're here. You're a conscious being having this experience. Namaste, mother flowers. Today, we welcome Chris Temple. He's a uh, 500 hour 
E-R-Y-T trained yoga instructor. He's also been teaching in New York City for about 10 years. And he is uh, easily one of my favorite yoga teachers ever. Uh, definitely in the top 10, uh, top 20, let's say. <laughs> 50 or so. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> definitely top two, top three. I mean, he's amazing. Chris is awesome. And we're gonna get into it with him today. So Chris, thanks for coming on. Thanks so much, man. Great to be here. Great to uh, be talking with you face to face. It's been a while. Yeah, it has been a bit. Yeah, it's, I used to, uh, it's been since like April, I think, since. I was last taking your classes regularly. Yeah. It's just been, I've been away from yoga for a bit. Sure. We'll, we'll talk about that maybe a little it bit. Happens. It, <laughs> it happens. It happens. Yeah, yeah. I can't right. wait to get back. Um, but yeah, I'd love to start off for the audience. It'd be great for them to, uh, to learn about your background a little bit, where you're from, your upbringing. You know, what's, what's the young Chris? Who is, who is he like? Well, I was born and raised in Jersey, Dirty Jers. Uh, grew up in Westfield, New Jersey, which is outside of the Holland Tunnel maybe like half an hour up until uh, my mid-teen years, and then my family moved to Warren, New Jersey, which is a little less, not that Westfield is very urban, but comparatively speaking, uh, Warren, New Jersey is a lot more, not even like suburbs, but like more like woodsy. Like okay. you, can't, you can't hit the house next to yours with a, a rock. It's too, everything's pretty spread out. Okay. Um, Jersey is the garden state, as most sure. people forget, because they fly in through Newark Airport and see all the <laughs> deliciousness of the uh, garbage dumps and you know just all the, uh, the factories and what have you. But it's actually a really, really beautiful place. Mm. Uh, grew up, uh, I'm one of seven kids. Oh, Big cool. old family, yeah. Um, my parents are both Catholic, although my mom did not start out that way, but when she married my dad, she wound up converting. Mm. Um, so yeah, I grew up four older sisters. I was my dad's first son, which was wow. a pretty big deal. My uh, grandfather, you know, it was at a time, and especially the, I'll say the true Catholics, whatever that means, but the true Catholics, they, they would not uh, find out whether they were having a boy or a girl. Like that uh, was like, yeah. you, you didn't like, mm. you, know, you didn't want to know that. It was like you were leaving it to God. Yeah. Um, I didn't know that so, broke out a Catholic. I didn't know that was a Catholic oh, yeah. thing. I'm Catholic, so I was like. Oh, oh yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, we'll get into all that. <laughs> sure, very well. Uh, so anyway, um, so my grandfather did not know whether I was going to be a boy or a girl, mm. but he bought my dad a set of trains. And he's like, well, if it's a girl, she better like to play with trains. So it was kind of a big deal that I was my father's first son after four girls. And then I have two younger brothers as well. Um, and we basically all grew up in the same house. My parents are still married mm. um, over oh, somewhere between 50 and 60 years. Wow. Dad just hit 82. Uh, Mom, I think, is just before 80. She's 79 now. Um, and yeah, I was back visiting them over the weekend. Um, good crew. Good, good, <laughs> good, good, good upbringing. Would good, recommend. devout Catholics. Yeah, so that's, that's basically me in a nutshell. Went to private school. Catholic school? Or? Catholic yeah, school. Same here. Uh, yeah. No. Well, public school in my younger years, and then somewhere around third grade, uh, switched over. And then... Yeah, and then went to went from private Catholic schools to very private, very Catholic schools <laughs> um, in my uh, in my high school years. Uh, yeah, there was a a school that is now in North Plainfield, New Jersey. Although at the time was in Warren, New Jersey, the town that I was uh, that I said we moved to later on, and. Uh, I'll tell you more about it later, but it was, uh, it's a Catholic school that was put together by this group of Catholic people who wanted to have their own school for their kids mm. to make sure that like God was at the forefront of everything that we learned. Yeah. In fact, when I was I, intense, it was, yeah, so it was like it, very intense. My first, smaller, it sounds like. Yeah, yes. Yeah. I, I was graduating class of 22 kids. Dang, yeah. Whoa. So like I had friends growing up that had classes of like hundreds of kids, sure, yeah. you know. In fact, there was a school like through the woods from our school and those were, yeah, huge classes. Um, yeah, so that's basically it in a nutshell. Um, yeah. Yeah, so solid, yeah, just big family, uh, Catholic upbringing. Were you into, were you personally religious like growing up, if you care to? Yeah, of yeah, course. Yeah. Um, you know, interestingly enough, I wanted to, I think I wanted to, I don't know. There's always this like dividing line between, I was a smart kid. 
So I knew <laughs> and humble. <laughs> well, no, I don't know. I, I mean, no, be I, honest, it's good. I think I, I, was, I, say, was, yeah. I was, I definitely was a humble kid. Struggle with insecurities, just like many yeah, other sure, people that sure. I knew. But I was a smart kid that I knew what people wanted to hear. Mm. So I will tell you, I wanted to be a priest at some point in my childhood upbringing. Okay. I think that is true, yeah. but there's always the possibility that I just knew that like everybody was thrilled to hear it. You know, mm. it's just kind of like yeah, it's in in the in the Catholic faith. If you're gonna like give your life that much to God, that's like that's money. Then your yeah. dad doesn't have to worry about dating. I mean, I was like, uh, I'm talking like you know maybe seven eight years old. Like mm. basically at the time you get your first Holy Communion, you're about yeah. seven. And I'm thinking to myself, I want to be a priest. And I think that for my parents, they're like, well, that makes our lives a heck of a lot easier. Sure. Especially having four older sisters. Although at that time, you know, they weren't getting themselves into any trouble. But uh, <laughs> so, yeah. So uh, was I into it? Uh, I was as a child. Um, I was into it. In school, I struggled with what we now know is like some sort of ADHD, mm. um, attention deficit disorder. When I so was when I was in school, I never got anything below a C. I had a couple C's on my report card, mostly B's. But you can guarantee I had an A in religion <laughs> and gym because one I because deal. I knew that if I came home without the A in religion, I'd be in yeah. trouble. But two, that's the way I was brought up. Like mm -hmm. what these kids were learning in school, I was being taught either A at church. From my parents, I also went to like Sunday school to like mm. extracurricularly learn about yeah. that stuff too. Yeah. So yeah, um, and then what happened was uh, in this is kind of a big deal in my elementary school years. There is a group of people called the People of Hope, mm -hmm. and they are what is called an ecumenical charismatic Christian. Okay, community sounds familiar yeah, yeah but what so that? people of hope um their sister community and 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 if we'll say that like there was a nucleus to this to this people of hope it was the sort of the spirit which was based out of michigan so people of hope is basically you got your catholics they're going to church and they had a few i think they were called jesus conventions i know there was like a jesus 79 um Probably 1979. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. 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 Uh, there was a couple, couple of iterations of it, and um, I went to one of them. My dad went to a few of them, and basically, from going to this, they met some people who were interested in. I guess you could say deepening their Catholic faith, but they were interested in having a place to be supported in their Catholic faith. I, I think that religions all start with the greatest of intentions. Like, mm. no one starts religion. Uh, yeah, mostly. Most, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mo sure. yeah. All the major religions, yeah, yeah. I think we can agree, <laughs> that they're, they're, they're done with good intent. You know, you believe in something. Oh, you believe in it too? Well, let's come up with our set of prayers. Let's hang out at the same place, and we'll yeah. say those prayers together. Uh, let's talk to each other about our uh, struggles, cares, worries, woe, success stories within this faith. And then it strengthens us in this faith. Well, a group of Catholics who were going to these Jesus conventions decided like, hey, let's create our own group. And it was called the People of Hope. What it originally started out, or as I remember as a kid, is about once a month, everybody would get together in uh, what they would call a general community gathering. And they would hear talks, they'd pray together, they would... Uh, Pray. We prayed like this. Mm -hmm. uh, there was people like they laid on their hands and they would like pass out. I've 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 had that experience wow. myself. Um, so they were getting together once a month and having these uh, prayer meetings, and then doing it for a while. And they're like, we want more. So they all kind of decided well, what if we all like move to the same spot? Because it mm. used to be you travel like at least an hour, sometimes hour and a half, maybe two hours to get together as a community. And then they're all like, well, let's move to the same spot. So Berkeley Heights, New Jersey. Who, I was just there the other day. Were you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not, not too many people know about Berkeley was, Heights, New Jersey. Through, yeah, yeah. What were you doing out there? I was going to see a friend uh, book for a barbecue. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, it's there. a good yeah, place yeah, to yeah. have a barbecue. Yeah, it's wonderful. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's a nice area. Um, 
So all these people decide, well, we're going to move to Berkeley Heights, New Jersey. Okay. Uh, there was a school and a church called Little Flower, a private school, Catholic mm-hmm. church. They have 6.45 masses every morning, 6.45 in the morning, mm-hmm. which was basically like, you know, eight elderly women, like <laughs> thumbing through their yeah, rosaries, exactly, yeah, and sure. the priest is just yeah, like, here yeah. I go again. Yep. Yeah. And now, yeah. now <laughs> they're packed. Whoa. 6.45 every morning, these masses are packed. Dang. Well, sounds like a good thing, but of course nobody likes change. Mm-hmm. So all the people who were part of that town are like, is going on here? Sure. And the school is now packed with kids and everyone wants to know what's going on here. Well, of course, communication, church, um, you know, I'm, I'm making friends. They're, they're here in... How what, old are you this time? Uh, I was in third, fourth grade. Um, probably, yeah. Third and fourth grade yeah. by the time we moved there. Actually, it was third grade, I remember specifically. Yeah. Um, and then, so the town got very aware of there's this group of people who are moving in. And on the one hand, in a lot of ways, it was a cult. And on the other hand... <laughs> People really overreact to everything. Uh, so the com- combination of both of those things, Damn. they're freaking out. There's a concerned citizens group that are meeting, you know, weekly. What are we going to do about the people of hope? Well, um, as it turns out, we were on Channel 4 News, NBC, ABC. We were on all the major news wow. networks. As a scandal. My, as, like, sort of, well, uh, like uh, as a cult, oh, like geez. taking over Berkeley Heights, New Jersey. I don't remember like all the news on it. But what I do remember is that it was very hard for me to go to school because, you know, they would call us the Hopis and like they were, they would like tease us and make fun of us. And, you know, and it's like, I wasn't even at that point, wasn't even really into it anymore. As a kid, I was like into like, Hey, maybe I want to be a priest or whatever. As a young adult or, or an adolescent, whatever we're calling that, um, it was definitely making my life not easy, and mm. school was a little weird. Um, there were some weird things I had to grow up with, like, for example, my sisters all had to wear skirts below the knee. Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah. Not at school, all the time. Oh, wow. Right, right. That's yeah, where people are like, oh, at school, that's not. No, 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 all the time. Um, you know, they were, like, they, they had to wear, everyone thought we were rich because my sisters were dressing up all the time. We weren't rich. It was just the fact that like, we were trying to stay modest before the Lord. Mm-hmm. And then at a point in my life, I wasn't allowed to even wear shorts. Wow. Not because so much it was immodest, but be- because if the girls had to do it, they were trying to make it fair yeah. that the boys needed to do it too, which yeah. I think, you know, so in, yeah. in the argument of equality, yeah. um, I didn't like it, but if you're going to do it, you know, we're in the summer. don't be sexist. <laughs> don't be, se- oh, it's miserable. It was miserable. But so, the question I'm answering is, yeah. was I into it? So at that point, I was anything but into it, you know. Uh, in fact, like, I would do anything to, like, deny I had anything to do with the group. Mm. Um, but, uh, well, I, I'll tell you this one story. So the extreme of, of, of the religion that I grew up with, on Halloween, we were not allowed to dress up as... I couldn't be a vampire. As sure. a kid, I could. Yeah, cult stuff. Yeah. I couldn't be a vampire. I couldn't be... I, I had to actually... I had to dress up as a saint. Oh. So the saint that I chose <laughs> was St. Barnabas, who was actually uh, the juggler of Notre Dame. Oh. So he would dress up like a clown, and yeah. his dedication was to Mary. But I remember my friends came to the front door, and they're like, oh, who are you, be- who, who are you supposed to be? And I was in such denial, like, didn't want them to think I had anything to do with this religious group. So I said, I'm a clown. And my mom overhears me saying it behind me, and this is, she says to me, well, Peter denied Jesus three times oh. as well. I'm like, oh, <laughs> like I was going to hell for saying I was a clown for Yikes. Halloween. So at that that's, point in my life, yeah, restrict. it was pretty yeah, brutal, pretty, yeah. pretty brutal. Um, and I know you would know that quote too. Yeah, of course. Uh, I was thinking of yeah. So, so then fast forward to high school. Um, that is when this group, the People of Hope, decided to open up their own high school. It was called Koinini Academy. Actually, I need to tell you one more story in that. Yeah. So not only did they all move to Berkeley Heights, New Jersey, but right about before the time I went to high school, we'll say like a year or two before, so 13 years old maybe, um, a group of people, including my father, bought 
property, 98 acres of what was considered to be swampland, although maybe not, mm -hmm. if they could convince the town that it wasn't swampland, they were able to build houses. Whoa, okay. Mary, Mary the mother of God, it's called Mary Street. Uh -huh. And my father was uh, a general contractor carpenter. He was with the Carpenters Union. I worked with him from the time I was in my early teens, probably even like 12, 13 years old, uh, up through high school and a little bit beyond. But he headed up this building, these nine houses mm -hmm. of all these Catholic people who were gonna send their kids to this new school. At the time, it was uh, nine through 12. It was called Koinonia Academy. Mm -hmm. Koinonia in Greek means fellowship in the Holy Spirit. Uh, and so that's where I went to school. Yes, of course, the girls had to wear skirts. We had uniforms, you know, the normal things yeah. that you would expect from uh, private school. Weren't allowed to listen to rock music. Like, we're not, like, and, and I'm, I mean like Billy Joel rock music, not like Sepultura. Yeah, I don't know sure. if that rings a bell for you. Or like, <laughs> not even like Metallica, who's not even like as edgy yeah. as people might think. Billy they are. Joel, that's pretty. Right, Billy Joel's pretty rough. In fact, I even got caught with a James Taylor oh. uh, cassette, which he's folk music. Yeah. But in one of the, uh, in one, and it's Simon and Garfunkel. Do you know who of Simon course, and Garfunkel yeah. is? Um, yeah, I was, I was like learning to play the guitar. Couldn't, couldn't play rock music on the guitar. But my dad wanted me to learn to play the guitar so I could play for prayer meetings. Sure. So I would play folk music and playing Simon or Garfunkel, my mom comes up into the room, hello darkness, my old friend. Mm -hmm. Like, what's that all about? And like when you say it, like I could see a, a concerned mother, like what does that mean? Sure. Um, but also with James Taylor, I'm a steamroller baby, I'm gonna roll all over you. They're like, that means sexual intercourse. Like, yeah. we can't be having that. <laughs> so I, my, my mom actually found rock music. I had in the middle drawer of my desk, I had a fake bottom. Oh, my god. And you goodness. popped it up. And she found James Taylor and Billy Joel. I got in all sorts of trouble. Uh, of all things to find. Right, of all things, right. Not that bad. Right, now I think of it, it sounds so hysterical. But it was a big deal at the time. Sure. But anyway, couldn't listen to rock music going to this high school. Couldn't date. You weren't allowed to date until you were 18. Yeah, we had the now same they, rule. Yeah. They did not yeah, have arranged house, marriages, yeah. but they, you had someone that you had to check in with, like, I'm gonna ask so-and-so out to date, like when it was time to date. Mm. So, so there was involvement, but it was not arranged. But from in, your parents or from the Hope Church? Or uh, or? Well, initially it would be from your parents, but then as the Hope Church evolved, the Hope Group evolved, um, you, you, after you moved, from your home, you would probably live with another group in, in the Hope Group, mm -hmm. and then you would get what is called a pastoral leader, a person that you would check in with about things like dating and yeah. jobs, and you know, okay. again, not a bad idea to have a check-in person, yeah. um, but people get crazy and things get crazy. But sure. in school, you weren't allowed to date, and if you were caught dating, uh, not if you were caught dating, if somebody like a teacher or the principal saw you talking to the same individual on a regular basis in a friendly, flirtatious manager, a call was going home to mom and dad to be like, no exclusive boy-girl relationships. It wasn't you can't date, no exclusive boy-girl relationships is how they phrased it. Meaning if you kept hanging out with the same one-on-one yeah. -on -one or in an overly friendly way, they were putting the smack down on it. So at that point in my life, believe it or not, I was kind of into it because I was like, it seemed easier rather than try. Well, first off, I came from a elementary school where I was like terrified of telling anybody about like my Jesus affiliations right. to going to a high school where it was like the thing. Like a lot of us- So you were hiding it and then- And then it was it like, but every, no, everyone's cool, yeah. doing it. It's yeah, like, yeah. this is what the cool kids yeah, are yeah. doing sort of thing. So I did buy into it for a while and we would actually go like to other towns and other schools and tell them about Jesus. <laughs> it sounds so funny no, to me to, to say that. Stuff okay, like that. Yeah, so yeah, you yeah, know. Yeah. Um, and we'd go and like evangelize because in the Catholic faith um, and a lot of Christianity, you know, you can't hide your light underneath the bushel basket. In fact, it's like a sin not to tell yeah. people God's truth. Sure. Um, so then, but like midway through high school, I was kind of like, nah. Wow. <laughs> like, yeah, I don't wow. know. What, I don't, yeah. I honestly don't know. I, I mean, my parents would say like, there's a couple individuals who come to mind who my parents would say were like a negative influence. Mm -hmm. But, you know, who was influencing who? We were all like kind of going in our own separate ways and, and like coerced each other into 
moving away from this group. Actually, at some point in the process of going to this high school, they started also their own Boy Scout group. Mm. Uh, I became a Boy Scout. And generally, you start Boy Scouts when you're in your early teens. Mm. We didn't start until I was like 14 or 15. Um, it was basically when I started high school. And of course, Boy Scouts is also a Christian affiliation, or at least it used to be. Maybe that's changed yeah, since then. That's been yeah, out of it, but yeah. Sure. I, I don't know. But I mean, there was like, you know, when you said the Boy Scout law, it was like to do duty to God in my country and to obey the Scout law. Um, but even that, so it was like, it wasn't just Boy Scouts, it was Boy Scouts from this Hope group. And me and the two individuals that come into mind actually wound up getting kicked out of the troop because we would sneak out in the middle of the night to the Girl Scout camp. And mind you, I wasn't doing anything at sure. that point. No, 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 I really, I really, I wanted to, but I was, I was, I was actually, I think at that point in my life, I was terrified of women, you know? Yeah, I was just like, yeah. they made me so, like Teenager, I would, yeah, 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 I would go there. And it, also I had the Catholic guilt, like even, mm. even whatever your desires were, the Catholic guilt in me was still strong enough that I was not going to cross any like, you know, lines in the sand. But we would sneak out and 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 get friendly with uh, the Girl Scouts. And then on one particular evening, um, the counselors from the Girl Scout camp came to our cabin and said, "We're missing three Girl Scouts. Uh, they're putting out a search." And Ed Gree, who is our troop leader, looks around and he's like, "Where's Temple?" And he names the other two guys, and we weren't there. So that was strike number one. Oh, wow. And then strike number two, I don't think it was the same trip. We were playing a game called Kill Mary. Yep. And, uh, and I think the troop leader's wife might have made into the mix, plus one of the nuns from our uh, elementary <laughs> school or high school Yikes. might have made it into the mix. And then that next morning, they like called us all in and they're like, the three of you are out of here. Wow. So kicked I think, out of the Boy Scouts. Yeah, kicked us out of the Boy Scouts. Kicked us off of that. And, and and at that point, you know, in a couple more years, we were going to have to leave anyway. <laughs> so it was like, I, I don't remember if they like fully kicked us out of the troop, yeah. but I think between, uh, and, and my, my dad had guests over that weekend. So I was coming home halfway through the weekend, like, what happened? And he's just like humiliated. But anyway, so that was kind of like when I started realizing I'm not so into this. Mm. Around the time I was 18, you uh, go on what is called the community weekend. You go to a whole intense weekend of learning about what it means to be uh, a member of the community of the people of hope. And uh, my parents, the Catholics believe that you were put on this earth to know, love, and serve God in this life, to be eternally with him in the next. That is why we are put on the earth. Um, and that is basically what you're learning about in this weekend. They wanted me to go on it. I said no. And they said, well, you have to leave. I was still living at my parents' house because I was 17 at the time. And they're like, well, you have to leave. And I'm like, I started packing my stuff and I said, let me give it a try. I half-heartedly went on this weekend. And then it was over. I'm like, I still don't want to be part of it. So they're like, you got to go. You know, they'll say they didn't kick me out of the house. I was going to be an adult soon. But I... You know, on the one hand, I was pissed, and I, there's probably some resentment still within me now, but I do believe as an adult, and, and I don't have any kids, so it's easy for me to say this, mm. but it's like, you know, if this is your place, and I don't want to adhere to your rules, I get it, like, um, and, and I had kid brothers that my parents were hoping would be part of this group too, yeah. so they're thinking, well, maybe, you know, he's going to be a negative influence on them. So I get it. So they basically kicked me out. And then at that point, you know, started my, I'm having nothing to do with um, the community, the People of Hope community. And then eventually came to uh, me kind of falling away as even a Catholic. You know, I don't think of it as falling away, just like having my eyes open to um, new possibilities and new spiritualities mm. and new ways of thinking. Like I... My parents are Catholic and they're still married. And I do believe, I do believe happily married after let's say 55 to 60 years. Um, and they will tell you it is because God first, the person I'm in love with second, yeah. and then me third. Like sure. um, the word joy, uh, one of the acronyms is Jesus, others, you. Mm. 
and they will tell you that that is why their marriage has worked because they stand before God. God wants them to be together forever. And I do believe it works for them. And I respect that. Like, sure. yeah, my parents go to church just about every day. Um, unless they're sick, they're going to, I don't think they go to 645 mass. That's too early for my dad. <laughs> he goes to nine o'clock mass that, yeah. now that he's retired and he goes every Sunday. And I do believe it is the cornerstone of their whole life. Like the people of hope is still around. And they have like things that happen every night of the week. Like mm -hmm. they have a men's night on, you know, let's say, well, what is it? It's, um, it's, it was like women's night on Tuesday night, men's night on Wednesday night, Thursday night was young adults, Friday night was like singles, mm -hmm. and then Saturday was basically uh, in the morning we would do service, like maybe go to someone's house and help them out, or sometimes a soup kitchen or some service related thing. Cool. You know, all, all pretty good stuff. Yeah. <laughs> not not yeah. bad at all. Sure. Um, and then Sunday they would have not only church, but then they'd have their general community gatherings that, you know, the whole thing started with. And then they'd also have district gatherings, which was like small neighborhood groups too, on alternating Sundays. So now the general communities are about twice a month and then the district gatherings once a month. So they get one Sunday uh, a month off. Um, it works for them and, and I respect that. Uh, it's not for me, but yeah. so, so yeah, that's the story of me and religion and, and, and I think- On the other side. <laughs> on, on the other side yeah. and, and because, you know, because it was so strict and so, you know, like, when I tell people, oh, my parents were really Catholic and whatever, and they're like, yeah, mine too. And then I start giving them some of the finer, were they they're Catholic? like, <laughs> you know, and that's why it's kind of like, oh, that's, yeah, that's, that's something. You know, and there's more. I mean, there's more stories yeah, of and craziness and whatever. But, like, ultimately, they're a bunch of good people that it was, like, religion on crack. and. Yeah. And anything on crack is a bad thing, you know? So it was like, it, it just got a little too much. And I know that, like, my parents with my brothers, they mellowed out a lot. Like, they, mm. my parents... You worked them in. Yeah. Well, yeah. And they grew up. They grew up on their own, you know? Yeah. And it's just, it's just like they've, they've, they're more open-minded. My dad's always been a very black and white guy. Mm. And it's... It's to a fault, but I respect that. It's just like he sees one way mm -hmm. and he goes for that one way. And anything that's the other way is just wrong. Yeah. Whereas like, you know, I admire people who feel so strongly about something mm -hmm. that they're unwavering. I've just mm -hmm. never felt that strongly that I'm not willing to hear another side of yeah. the spectrum or the other side of the coin. So it's been... Yeah, because you're an open person. You're open Very, minded. you know, yeah. I, you know, and, and I, I, I will say though, like if you go out that 45 minutes, it's like a 45 minute car drive in New Jersey from New York City. It is a completely different demographic. Mm. It is just so different. Like I did not experience a lot of ethnicity growing up. Sure. If there was a black family at my church, not that we were prejudice or racist or anything like that but you knew that there was a black family at the church mm -hmm. they drew attention really the same thing kind of with Asians we had like I think I had like two two Asian people in my class and the rest of us were white and again I don't think it's because we were pushing anybody away it's just that's you know that's the how yeah the demographics were there and um I think because I moved to the city, and although I've never actually lived in New York City, I've always lived right outside of the city, and I'm very happy to stay there. <laughs> um, but it's, it's easy to fear something or be scared of something when you're not facing it on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. So when I came to the city and saw a lot more diversity on like sexual preference, sexual identity, race, um, whatever, gen you name it. It's just like people who you, you meet and you like them and then you find out these things about them that you were, I don't know, taught to fear or hate. You're having an experience. I'm not saying you won't get past it, but initially I remember my first uh, bartending job and I'm like, I think I'll be the only straight man in this, in this staff. Yeah, it's and in it house was, kitchen, and you're like, yeah, what's going on? Right, and I, like my heart started pounding a little yeah, bit. Yeah, like, yeah. I don't know why or yeah. what, you know, uh, but I had a moment with it, and then now it's just like, 
I don't even think twice about well, sure, it. Yeah, yeah, it's but it, it's because I wound up moving out closer to the city, mm. and I'm I'm faced with so much more diversity in all shapes and sizes. It's easier for my my family and my kid brother even, who's beautiful, beautiful family. He's got six kids. He's forty years old. Um, he lives a different life. He has a yeah. different, um, you know. Perspective. Perspective. Yeah. yeah. There, there's a word that's that's escaping me right now, but his visuals are just much different than mine are, and because of that, it's easier to kind of, you know, think a certain way, do a certain thing. Whereas, you know, when people get close to you, get near and dear to you, and you realize that they're not maybe what you were brought up to uh, appreciate, we'll say. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's definitely a, a, a different way of thinking when you're up close and personal, but I love it. I yeah. Love it. yeah. That's why you sure. stuck around. Yeah, for <laughs> sure. You're still it's, it's like my favorite place to be. New York city. Sure. I mean, or, yeah, around here. yeah, well, new, I mean, New York city. I mean, I'm in the city pretty much every day yeah. of the week. Um, I spent about four years out in Colorado. Soon thereafter, moving from my parents' yeah, out. Yeah, let's go. Yeah, I want to Moved hear, yeah. out to Colorado. Well, lived why with Colorado? my grandparents okay. for a while. Moved with my grandparents for a while because they would take care of me. Uh, and then kind of outgrew them. Ooh, I think there was a, a female involved. And uh, perhaps I got caught in way, some way, shape, or form. <laughs> They're up, up, up in heaven right now, listening down to this story. Uh, but my grandfather's like, I, I think you may have outgrown us. It's, it's time for you to move on. Four years. And then I moved into my sister's. Uh, she was living further out in Jersey, in an even more kind of like rural area. Uh, she was living with her boyfriend at the time, who was a kid that I went to elementary school with. And actually, we even got into a fist fight at one point. Oh, uh, now my sister's dating him, and, and I wound up moving in with them. Um, and at that point in my life, I think because I'd lived such a sheltered life, you know, basically tucked under some rock, there was a lot of exploration with like drugs and uh, I became a pretty avid pot smoker mm -hmm. for sure. Um, did some other drugs, cocaine, drank a bit. Drinking what uh, was never really my thing at the time, but I, I had my fair share of you know, uh, partying and stuff like that. Was bartending, had started college. Um, that was about the time my parents asked me to leave. So uh, when I moved to my sister's, just very ungrounded, I wound up backpedaling out of uh, junior college I was in that time. And then um, basically had got myself in a very stuck place where it's like my routine was like, go to work, get off of work, party with my friends wake up hungover the next morning, smoke some pot to feel better, start it all again. Sure. And it became this, it became this crazy, uh, it became this crazy vicious cycle that I was like, I actually was like, I was working at an insurance company at the time too. Uh, my parents, not a very interesting story. My grandparents um, got me a job in a mail room at an insurance company and I worked myself up a couple notches. That's actually when I went, that how I wound up going to school because they were paying for my education. Mm. Um, but I was working for an insurance company at the time and I sat at my desk and I started getting teary eyed being like, I don't know what it's like to feel normal anymore. It had been a while since I felt normal because I was always like stoned or drunk or something. It's yeah. like my head felt really, really cloudy. Well, a buddy of mine from New Jersey, a guy probably about five years older than me, knew me since I was a kid. He used to like, you know, take us out and my dad had a pickup truck and all the kids would get in the back of the pickup truck and he'd drive us around. This was before the time anyone would sue everybody. Like this, <laughs> <Early> <laughs> <up>. right, <laughs> long time ago. So he drives around. Anyway, he, he knew me growing up and he saw that I was struggling and he said, hey Chris, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm living out in Colorado. We're living in what used to be a convent. He, he was a Catholic guy, religious guy. We're living in a convent. There's, you know, not a convent anymore. It was just an empty space. So the church is letting me and some people, some guys live there if you're interested in coming out. And I'm like, no, nah, no, nah, nah, I'm cool, I'm cool. I mean, at that time, I think I was drunk and stoned. And I was like, no, 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 I'm good. And then fast forward to a little while longer, and I was like, I'm done with this. And I needed to, like, press pause on my current way of living. And then I shot out to Colorado and spent about four years out there mm -hmm. to like 
get clean, I guess. Yeah, get away. It yeah. was just to, really to break the routine and try a new, you know, change of scenery goes a long way. Absolutely. You know, it's just like you could be doing the same job in two different places, but then when you take that new job, you may still hate it, but it buys you a little bit of time. Mm. Like you got like a year or two maybe yeah, before you're like, yeah. I'm back, I'm, I'm in the same place, just different faces. Sure. So I went out to Colorado forever thinking, <laughs> um, and it was great. It's a wonderful place. Yeah, it's like beautiful. Colorado, yeah. It's beautiful. Did all the things you're supposed to do out mm-hmm. there. Did a lot of camping, mountain biking, hiking, um, Saw multiple shows at Red Rocks. Oh, beautiful. Thing. Yeah. yeah oh, so amazing. So amazing. Uh, used to do the 4th of July with uh, Blues Traveler, watching all the fireworks going off the back. Not a big Blues Travelers fan, but it's it was cool. fun and yeah. it had the fireworks. I mean, they're, they're a talented band. Yeah. Uh, we used to go to Reggae on the Rocks, you know, cool. all, all sorts of good stuff. But, you know, Colorado was great, but I, I, I hit a wall in Colorado when I realized, like, I'm, I'm just not built for this. Now, meaning like fast forward to when I'm older, this kind of like slower, more chill way of life. I felt like I was stressed out around everybody all the time. Oh, like everybody was like super like cool huh. and chill. Yeah. And I was still smoking pot at the time. Yeah, sure. It's Colorado. Um, yeah, it's Colorado. <laughs> um, I was still smoking pot at the time, but uh, but I felt like I was like at a higher vibration than everybody else. Not like spiritually. I know Just what you mean. Li- okay. Yeah, I get it. Yeah. yeah. So so I was uh, decided to. Um, to come back. And there was some, um, some ideas of perhaps doing some performing. Uh, I was out in Colorado and before I got to Colorado, I did a little bit of performing in the theater. Did a show in college, just there was a student written show. And then I got a couple more community theaters uh, roles doing like West Side Story. Oh, I, musicals. I, I, yeah, musicals. Uh-huh. Um, well, this girl who I, I, lo- I always loved to sing, this girl that was in my vocal class um, said, hey, Chris, you know, you got a good voice and you like acting. Let's, uh, let's audition for this West Side Story. Mm-hmm. So that kind of spiraled a whole bunch of, did a, a, a bunch of musicals, 42nd Street. Learned to tap dance on the fly, like just took crash courses in tap dancing. So when I went out to Colorado, I did a lot of dancing. It's like, that kind of became my occupation. Not that I was being paid to do it, but it's like, that's what I did with all my free time. Um, I I was basically bartending like three nights a week, one day a a week, so four shifts, and then danced as much as I could. I don't know why. I just loved it. Like it, it was yeah, that if you simple. Love it, you love yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. It was. It was That's kind awesome. of a no-brainer for me, and it's actually what eventually got me into yoga. Um, Interesting. But when I was moving, when I was done with Colorado, it was partially because I wanted to go back to New York and try out performing, uh-huh. doing some singing and dancing. Cool. So, so I moved back to the city, and uh, yeah, and then did some performing. Did some. A decent amount of professional work. There was a time, you know, I was always bartending in, in, on and off in between. Uh, did a decent amount of performing. And then had this kind of epiphany one day as like I was in the dressing room and everybody's like, we're about to do, I, I don't even remember the show. Actually, I got a job on a ship. We were singing and dancing on the ship oh, for show. about yeah, six yeah. months. Yeah, it was, it was fun. We're all sitting in the dressing room and I was probably just, you know, have you you've been on a cruise ship? Of course. Yeah. Okay. Of course. I mean, well, no, I mean, yeah, of, no, not everyone has. Yeah. yeah <laughs> I not say. a lot of people. I mean, have. Yeah, that's a very privileged thing to say. <laughs> right. I can't You're believe, like, I can't everybody. believe I just came out. I mean, I, I've been on one, and I was like, <laughs> of course, fourteen. Okay, yeah, my but family. you've been on one. You've been on. Sorry. One. No, no. Totally. <laughs> no, I just realized to check yourself. Okay. <laughs> right. Exactly. Come on, everybody's been. Ugh. Well, you know, I hadn't done much traveling until I was about twenty-six or twenty-seven. Mm. Like I'd never left the country. In mm. fact. I can even say maybe I've never made it past like Chicago at that point in my life. But um, I, was, I was working on a ship and we're in the rehearsal, uh, sorry, we're in the dressing room about to do a show in a half an hour and everybody's singing some like new musical that came out. And I'm like, ah, oh, this is annoying. <laughs> <laughs> and then I realized, oh, this is what they always do. And then we would like go out drinking and they would all be singing. And I was like, oh, this is what they always do. So I hit this wall where I was like, I don't enjoy being like this all the time. I like doing it on the stage 
And then even that, like with musical theater, like I like more like, I like drama. Like I like dark. I like heart wrenching. I oh, like okay. like real tears. Like that's Whoa. the kind of that's the kind of shows I like. This kind of this kind of stuff Jazz I didn't. Hands. And because I'm like I'm a pretty you know <laughs> animated person, yeah. I was getting more of this type <laughs> this type of work. And I was like, and be, and because of that, I was around a certain type of musical theater people, who. God bless them. They're wonderful people, but I was out of place, mm. and I was getting to be a crankpot in that in that uh, in, in 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 that scenario. So I was huh. like, I think this is not for me. And that's when I started backpedaling and kind of reevaluating things. Bartended for a little while more, and then eventually wound up uh, a, a a buddy of mine from work at one of the places I was bartending. He was like, Hey, I'm going to uh, I'm going to go to uh, an, an open house for audio engineering. He knew I was a musician. Oh, right. So he's like, you want to come? And so we went, and I wound up going to school for audio engineering. Wow. Yeah. What, what spot, why, like, why did you love it? I, I, well, I was a musician. I think initially yeah. what I went in there for was because I was a singer guitar player, you know, wrote some songs. I was interested in being able to record my own stuff without oh. having to hire, uh, yeah you know, a music house. Because at the time, we were just starting out in you can record your own stuff at home. Like if you were recording your own stuff at home, it was still costing you thousands of dollars, oh. but it was doable. Mm -hmm. So um, I was interested in learning how to do that. And I had, I had some natural, some natural um, intuition, some natural talent with that stuff that I like knew things sounded good. I just wasn't sure how to massage or manipulate them to sound how I wanted to or not. Like I had some recording, yeah, just a, a bit of natural know-how, but I wanted to solidify what I knew. So I went to school for audio engineering and it was great and I love it and I'm, and I'm, I'm a dork at heart. Like I love technology and I love science. Mm. Um, I'm not like the smartest person in the world. So if science gets too sciencey, um, I get lost, but like for your average person, yeah. I like to dig a little deeper than sure. just the basics. So, yeah. so I really enjoyed learning about like frequencies and compression and dynamic mm. range, um, oscillators, all that stuff. Um, and then when I got done, it was like, okay, so I was recording uh, some of my own stuff and it was great, but that's not how I was going to make money. And I was interested in not bartending and waiting tables anymore or yeah, sure. or at least for that time so um so i'm i was speaking to a guy at the bar that i was working at and he's like if you really want to make money in this industry you have to get into network television oh. he was fortunate enough he's like trust me when i tell you he's like i can listen to a recording and i can <laughs> tell you what microphone was probably used i can tell you the guitar that they're playing. I can tell you the amplifier that they used. He's like, I was so good at this stuff, yeah. but I could not get enough work to sustain a living. So he got into network TV. Now, with that said, he was working on music shows that were being broadcast on television, but he wasn't there for the music show itself. He was there to do the broadcasting part. Right. You're, mi you're still mixing music and all that yeah. stuff, but actually at, the point, at that point, he was more of a higher up in the whole, uh, in the whole wheelhouse. Um, so he's like, yeah, you gotta get a job in network television. Oh. So I got an internship at a place called the, the, mu the, the record plant, um, which used to be, a record uh, music house, yes. and they got into post-production. Um, the guy, Roy McDonald, he actually was a keyboard player, played on a lot of uh, albums that, you know, are where at least my older siblings listen to. I listen to some of them. Um, and then Irene, she was basically wife of the guy that started the music house. And they uh, had a post-production house. Now, Vi Roy was doing the video editing. Mm -hmm. And then they got, uh, they hired audio engineers to mix their stuff. So wound up doing a lot of uh, audio engineering for the Travel Channel, Food Network, 
Um, I did ABC's Wife Swap for a while, all post production. I didn't do, I didn't go to site and shoot the sound. I did all the editing afterwards. I knew at that point because at that point I was a little later, a little later in life. I was about thirty and change, um, maybe like thirty five, thirty six. And I knew from traveling. I told you I hadn't traveled until I was about twenty six. But then from twenty six till thirty six, I traveled a lot. Oh, okay. Um, a lot of it was professional, some of it was recreational, but I knew enough to know that I wasn't interested in traveling on set and doing that whole, because it was like long days yeah. and, and, and a lot of traveling and, you know, not, I, I traveled enough as a performer to know that it's like, it's hard because I tend to be ADHD and an ungrounded person, the more situations that ground me, the better off I am. And, mm -hmm. You know, it's kind of a no-brainer. Yeah. Um, so I got a job working with them, mixing shows, got some other work, and then had another epiphany. And what it was is I kind of got out of the restaurant business into the uh, audio engineering business. One, because obviously it's more rewarding. It's more intellectual. Yeah. Like, no duh. But also, um, I was like so burnt out on people, especially as a bartender. It's very mm. hard to be around drunk people all the time. Sure. So, uh, but then as an audio engineer, I was working, I remember I was working, uh, I think they're still over there, CBS College Sports is over in Chelsea Piers. Sure. Okay. So if you crawl down the corridor, there's this little room that's, you know, maybe like a 10 foot by 15 foot room mixing station. And it was like a cave that I would crawl into mm -hmm. Five hours later, the producer would come check in on me. I'd li have him listen to a little bit of what was going on. Okay, looking good. See you tomorrow. Another, you know, five hours to myself. So I was having these 10-hour days. Well, when you get out of work at, you know, 10 o'clock at night at Chelsea Piers, ain't much going on over there. Yeah. I'm like, is it the apocalypse? <laughs> um, but then I was on the other side of the spectrum. I'm like, okay, so I don't love bartending and being like around people all the time and in your face and kind of like locked in the cage because as a bartender it can be a lot of fun mm. but if you don't feel like doing it it's not like you can hide from the people you're right. like standing there some people come in in the bar and they're expecting you to talk to them right you know you're their entertainment a lot yeah. of times like people would sit down without a book and 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 they wouldn't be sit by the tv i'm like oh no they didn't want me to talk to them. Yeah. So, but then on the other side of the spectrum as an audio engineer, I'm like, okay, well, this is, this is terrible. And some <laughs> of secluded. <laughs> yeah, it, it was like, yeah, it was terrible. So. I enjoyed the work. Though. I love the work. Yeah, I love yeah. the work. Here's, the, I love the creativity of it. Mm. I loved, like sometimes, you know, I was, I was mixing like some, uh, some college football stuff. And like we were missing the tracks of like the, the grunts and the, and the pows. And I'd be in the sound booth making my own Foley. So I'd be like, raw, like making all these screams and stuff, like being the crowd, like that one guy screaming. It was a lot of fun. That's you know, cool. you create your yeah. own stuff. Yeah, for sure. But the bulk of it, to be honest with you, was a desk job. So, you know, especially modern day, now everything's digital. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they spent a ton of money uh, to, to have the equipment that they have. But we were at a point where you didn't need to have equipment that you were had to stand up, plug things in, sit back down, listen. You know, it was like everything was basically on a Mac, oh. you know. And, uh, and I was looking at, like, the guys that I looked up to. And they all kind of looked like me, except they had this huge belly. And no judgment, but I was like, yeah, very stereotypical. <laughs> and I'm like, I don't think, I, I mean, you know, it's like, if you see a pattern and you don't recognize the pattern, mm. shame on you. I was recognizing the pattern. I was like, and I was also noting that I was in constant pain. Mm. Like, sitting down all day. Sitting yeah, down just, all day. Sure. You know, it's just like, it, it became like a psychological battle. And I was trying to fix it. I think at that time, I wasn't, I, I went from like, you know, being a, the party guy that I was, avid pot smoker. I think at that point, point in my life, pretty much like square as can be. Wow. Yeah, at that point I was like, coffee was basically the only drug mm. that uh, of choice, or at least caffeine in some way, shape and form. I'm sure I did the occasional like, what is a five hour energy yeah, drink yeah, or yeah. something. But I, and that's what I was using to try to like get through the psychological psychological battle of, what honestly, and this is not, the people who can do it are meant for it. I was not meant for the auto engineering at a desk yeah. because I was just trying to get through the day in pain, in pain, 
and amplify myself with caffeine to try to get through it all and then being done and being like, you know, just so, so I went back into bartending for about two more years. Now, yoga. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Here comes the yoga. Now, yeah. to be honest, somewhere around the time when I was about 18 or 19, I got a book called Richel, Richard Hittleman's 28 Day Yoga Exercises. Okay. And it was a book of a 28 day plan of you learning to do yoga. Huh. Now, mind you, ADHD reading a book about yoga did not do very well but there was a a seed planted there i don't know why saw the shapes was interested in what was going on as a kid i always wanted to do martial arts you know as i told you i wound up getting into dance so there was something about movement that was obviously appealing to me and even as a kid in my parents community because there was a lot of marriages because that's what Catholics do, they get married. Um, I went to a lot of weddings, and with those a lot of weddings, there was always dancing. They always yeah. had like um, big band music, so I did a lot of like dancing with my sisters, with my friends, whatever. Mm -hmm. Did a lot of dancing. So there was the seed planted with that book, although never took off with it. Fast forward until the time when I'm in high school, maybe like first or second year of high school, and I got a couple, I had to be in, been driving, so I was at least 16 at the time. Um, and I got uh, videotapes of, um, it was Rodney Yee's, tw uh, Rodney Yee's uh, Power Yoga for Flexibility. Rodney Yee's Power Yoga for Strength. Okay. Power Yoga was like a phrase they were using. Yeah, it, was, yeah. it was yoga I'd come to find. But yeah, but, yeah it sounded I mean, cool. It, it did, it did. I, I mean, so, and, and also like I, I wanted to be flexible. I was, you know, with, with the, my desire to dance and, and with my love for movement, I wanted to be more flexible. So I got into it. It was about a 20 minute video that after a while, what I did was, there was no such thing as an i anything at the time. There were no iPad, uh, iPods, there were, uh, which aren't even a thing anymore. There were, <laughs> there, there were MP, MP3 players. There were MP3 players and I took an MP3 player and recorded, I just okay. put it by the TV, left it alone sure. and recorded it because then with traveling as a performer later on, um, I had memorized the sequence enough visually that I could do it if I just heard his voice doing it. Got it. On and off for years, on minutes. and off. 20 minutes just of yoga, that was it. Took whole me through, body kind of deal. Whole body, not even was really. Was it a style, was it vinyasa? It was, was vinyasa. Okay. It was basically, uh, it was based off the Ashtanga practice, okay. um, which is, Patabi Joyce is the what what's called the primary series, which is a it's basically it it's it's two sequences, a standing series, and then a bunch of stretches on the floor. And and that's it usually takes you about two hours to get through the whole thing. The abridged version that I did was twenty minutes. It was the first two sequences and then some stuff on the floor. So the whole like middle <laughs> standing sequence was omitted there weren't any like leg balance it was nothing hard like okay. if I were to do it now <laughs> I'd probably be like you know give this to my parents because uh, it, it was it was challenging for me yeah. at that time and I think it would be challenging for most people yeah. but it wasn't that involved but it was just enough to get you moving through some of the major ranges of motion in the body and that's like all the yoga that I did from probably the time that I was again about 16 or 17 until I was probably about 25 or so is that right I think so yeah that's about I'm right. gonna fact check this yeah please do Make sure uh, right. and then my girlfriend at the time and I she was an Irish dancer we had met doing a show out in Wisconsin called A Touch of Ireland. Um, because I mentioned to you, uh, with singing and playing the guitar, I wasn't allowed to listen to rock music. I'm half Irish on both sides. So I wouldn't say like we're hugely Irish, but I did grow up with some Irish heritage. I can play for three hours straight Irish music. So that was part of the reason why I got this job. Met this girl. She's like, hey, I'm doing uh, a yoga class in New York City, you wanna come? I wasn't living in the city at the time or close to the city at the time. So we took a big Bikram class together, mm. hot yoga, original 26 pose series. Um, and me, she was a dancer, more flexible than I was. 
but I've been doing this yoga very off and on. I can't say on and off, very off and on <laughs> for years, oh, yeah. but enough that I was like, oh, I should be okay. This was so hard. The Bikram, have you ever done a hot Bikram I've done class? yoga, I've done hot yoga. I don't know if it was Bikram or yeah. not, but I can attest yeah. that it's, especially yeah. if you're not used to it. Yeah. It's just like your first time, my goodness. The yeah. heat I've is, lost like pounds. Yeah. For you sure. Know, of sw- you know, right, in, in an hour and a half, you've lost yeah. like pounds. Okay. And that's why people love it. It's like, I do love it. I you do, like do it, yeah. feel like you're getting instant value out of it. Oh, for sure. Now, my, anyway, that first class was so hard. And I honestly, like, even basic things, like we were doing, this is called an eagle wrap, mm-hmm. and I couldn't even do that. Like, my oh. shoulders were too tight. Um, I did, I worked out a lot. I wasn't like a huge guy by any means, but I was muscular, but I was muscular without any range of motion. So simple stuff was really hard to me, but for some reason, I still loved it. You know, maybe it was the heat, maybe it's yeah. because as someone who's always struggled with focus, you have no choice. Right between the heat and just trying to figure out what you're supposed to be doing, you have two choices, pay attention or pass out. Mm. So you're like, you, 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 it tends to hyper-focus, the right person, it tends to hyper-focus them. Yeah. And I loved it, and then I got into it, uh, I got into it, we did it on and off with her, she kind of fell out of love with it. Um, we wound up breaking up, but she fell out of love with it way before that. And again, I very off and on kept with it for, I want to say like eight years. Okay. Yeah, but big, big pockets of time where I wouldn't do it for like the better part of a year, yeah, you know? Yeah, so you falling in, off of yoga, I, I've been there. Yeah, who has? I mean, yeah. for working out in general. And exercise, any workout, right? Yeah, everybody is... falls off the wagon and, and, and what have you. Or eating healthy or whatever. Um, it's easy to fall out of practice. But, so I'm doing this Bikram yoga and... I'm seeing somebody else who, uh, she taught vinyasa yoga. Mm. She had her own business, et cetera, et cetera. And she's like, well, let's do a class together. So she came to a Bikram class. And by the way, I have to say this because it's so embarrassing. Um, I was wearing the Speedo shorts. (laughs) I'm like mortified to think (laughs) that I was wearing the Speedo. But that's what everybody did. That was the fashion. That was what you were supposed to do. And I was a proper follower at that point Mm -hmm. in time. Um, But so she came to a Bikram class with me. She's like, Bikram's not usually my thing. And I noticed she was actually struggling in the class, Mm -hmm. which is interesting because... You think, oh, you're good at yoga, but yoga, there's many different types of yoga. And yeah. if I took a Bikram class right now, I would be struggling. Ooh. I'm very, very strong in vinyasa, but it's a totally different beast. Yeah. Then I took a class with her in vinyasa. At this point in my life, um, we actually were dating. I can't even really call her my girlfriend. We dated for a while. But at this point in my life, I was back to bartending and she knew that I was looking for a shift. And she's like, have you ever considered teaching yoga? She's like, I think you have the personality for it and you seem to really love it. And that's like kind of the most important thing. Yeah. But I think you should give it a shot. So I investigated getting my teacher training with Bikram Yoga. Mm-hmm. At the time, it was an investment of probably about over $20,000. Whoa. Because <laughs> it was about, <laughs> right? Sticker shock. Yeah, yeah for yikes. sure. So it's like probably about 13000 for the education. But at the time, you had to do it, I think it was out in California. Sure, yeah. And then if I'm going out there, I have to pay for room and board, food, yeah. etc. So it was going to be a big chunk of change to go out mm-hmm. there. I'm like, I just frankly don't have the money at the time. And taking a loan out to become a yoga teacher just didn't seem... Prudent. Li- yeah, yeah, it didn't seem prudent. So... Uh, She's like, well, you should try other studios. And she mentioned Sonic Yoga to me, which is in, it's currently in Hell's Kitchen, but at the time was in Hell's Kitchen on 9th Avenue between 50th and 51st Street. In fact, if you go there, the sign is still outside. What? It's very washed down and it's, it's, uh, it's neon green and like baby blue. That was the original Sonic colors. Yeah, look for that. Delicious. Um, right down the street. But I Googled the studio and I went to their open house 
and I met the, the, the head teacher at the time. Her name was uh, Johanna Alderidge at the time. And she is, um, I say there are two types of yoga. There are more than two types of yoga, but I say there are two types of yoga. There's nuts and bolts yoga, and there's rainbows and unicorns yoga. So there's like the yoga that like, you're stretching your bicep, you're stretching your tricep, this is elevating your blood pressure, you're releasing CO2 more slowly. There's science behind the yoga. It's not like this woo-woo uh, that yoga sometimes get a stigma for. Mm -hmm. And then there's the rainbows and unicorns, the chakras, the panchakosha, the subtle body stuff. Well, this woman was a little bit more rainbows and unicorns, but she also had, she had some nuts and bolts going on as well. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what attracted me towards it. It had this sort of, the studio and this particular person had this like magical feel to all of it, but it also felt like it wasn't like, you know, hokey. Hmm. So somewhere in between. Hmm. I honestly, if I stepped into that studio 10 years prior, especially having my background, I would kind of want to have nothing to do with it. I would have been like, get away from me, you guys are weirdos. I, I grew up yeah. with this kind of crap. I could see. You know, I don't need to like, you know, the whole like tree hugger um, sort of mentality. I was just like, you know, no part. I, as, as much as I do consider myself a very liberal and open person, there is, I'm also, a, I'm a cynic. Mm. I, 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 I walk up into situations a non-believer until proven otherwise. So I kind of, mm. yeah, I'm always kind of like watching from afar, yeah. but I'll watch from afar with an open mind. Okay. And then as I see things working out, I'll, I'll gravitate towards the things that I, I like that are working for me. So this teacher was a balance of both. And then I was, you know, I had never taken a class at the studio. So the teacher training started in about a month. I'm like, I guess I'll take some classes here. Took some classes here. I, I will mention um, that woman who had mentioned Sonic Yoga to me, so she came to the Bikram class, and I don't know if you remember, but in a Bikram class, they don't play music. Mm. It's just you, your body, yeah. your breath, your mind. In the vinyasa class, they were playing, you know, it was yoga music, but I was like, what is this music? Until like it does, yeah, music does definitely. something to your soul. Yeah, yeah. Is that a good or a bad thing? Well, it just depends. You know, it's a tool mm -hmm. and it can also be a crutch. So it's like you decide, sure. but I know that I was very much attracted to this idea of like, oh, music can take you part of the way there, especially if you're not going to get there at own, on your own. Meaning like yoga is meant to open us up in certain ways, whether that be open you up like more flexibility or more mobility or open you up just emotionally and energetically. I mean, we can talk more about that, yeah, but yeah. the point of the matter is music can take you part of the way there mm. before the yoga even starts working. Mm. Whereas the yoga itself, you may be, you know, a little bit stiffer on all those different levels um, and it may not work for you as well. So the music, I do believe, can help propel people. It, it works that way for me anyway. Mm. So I really like this idea of music being played in class. Mm. And uh, so sonic yoga was vinyasa yoga. Vinyasa means it's yoga that moves in a particular order with the breath. So in a Bikram class, you're doing this pose on this side, and then you're doing this pose on this side, and it's a quadricep stretch mm -hmm. on both sides. And then you're gonna do a forward fold, which stretches out your hamstrings on both sides type of thing. It's very much this to this. Vinyasa moves from pose to pose. If you're doing like a true vinyasa flows, it off uh, vinyasa flow, it often will move one breath, one movement, which isn't as fast as some people think it. It doesn't have to be, but the point is, is you're stringing poses together to get the benefits not only of the individual poses, but also the transitions in between them. Mm. So this was also appealing to my dance background. Because the movement yeah. of vinyasa yoga is, yeah, it's, it, it, when it's done, especially, you know, some of the flows that I now teach, but the ones that I definitely loved at that point are very much towards um, dance, you know. It, and, and I believe ultimately the reason why people like to dance is they like to move. They like to move in a rhythm. They like to move in a rhythm while they're breathing in a healthy kind of way, if you're doing it right. Yeah. Um, 
So I uh, fell in love with vinyasa yoga, fell in love with sonic yoga. That was in 2013 when I did my teacher training. And at the time, as I mentioned, bartending, I was able to, Sonic at the time offered uh, what was called an intensive teacher training. So for one month, Monday through Friday, 9 a.m. to 6 p.m., you went into the studio, got an hour for lunch, and you did basically a two-hour practice every morning. And then you learned about yoga, which a lot of it was like the philosophy, the theory, yeah. the anatomy, um, the subtle body, the meditation. There's many, many different aspects of yoga. So some of it was lecture and you were just sitting there, but a lot of it was, okay, now you have to teach each other. Well, if you're going to teach each other, you got to be doing more yoga. So some days you were doing like four hours of yoga, not like, you know, you've taken my class. It wasn't four hours like that, but, but two hours of it about yeah, was. Every day. But honestly, that wasn't the hard part uh, on the body. Mind you, I was an audio engineer, miserable because I'm not moving around at all. Now I'm doing this yoga, uh, you know, education, edumacation, and it was, uh, it was pretty brutal on the body, but not because of the moving. It's because yogis sit on the floor, so we don't have chairs or anything. You're sitting on a hardwood floor for lectures for like, you know, five, six hours of the day. Mm. It, it was pretty hard on the body, sure. but I loved it. And it was like a little retreat that you went home from every night, you know. Yeah. I was still working on the weekends, but I, I plowed through it. Um, when, so the way that the Yoga Alliance worked, the Yoga Alliance was invented. All these people were teaching yoga all around the US especially. And they're like, somebody's gotta set some guidelines for mm. the way yoga is taught and the way that yoga is taught to teachers to make sure that like certain rules are being followed. So the Yoga Alliance was created. I actually don't know when it was created. Um, I wanna say like in the 90s probably, cause that's when yoga really started hitting the map in, uh, in the US. It's I mean, like a, it's it, an American association? It's a domestic thing or is it? It, it is worldwide, but yes, it's yeah. mostly America and Canada. So Northern, uh, Northern America, Northern continent. Um, but, so the intensive was a 200 hour certification with the Yoga Alliance. You're, you're there in the studio for about 180 hours. And then those extra 20 hours is you practicing the stuff or learning or studying for the stuff that you did in the classroom setting. After that, went ahead and got my, or signed up for a 300 hour certification, mm -hmm. which ultimately would become a 500 hour certification. Um, with again sonic yoga they had a 300 hour certification they still have one right now although post pandemic they're pausing it until january of next year um and did the 300 hour certification and then started teaching yoga in 2014. at sonic started with my uh, my community class the thing i'm gonna i am humble but i also know that like when I first started teaching, I, I tend to be a pretty comfortable person talking in front of people. Mm -hmm. um, but when something's important to me, I get very nervous and I'm, I can be a perfectionist. I'm not the kind of perfectionist that won't do something because uh, I'm, I'm such a perfectionist. Like it will get done, mm -hmm. but I'll be kind of like watching myself in third person the entire time and just like judging the shit out of myself the entire time. So for the first about year, I, I, I say I was Chris the Cardboard Robot, like teaching just like all in my head, being very technical, wow. not letting my personality come out. I'm sure it's squeezed out a bit here sure. and there, but I knew as I was teaching and finishing teaching, I knew I was not giving people Chris. I was giving people the technical things that I had learned and trying to perfect that. Mm -hmm. And I don't think it was a bad process. It's just the way that start, yeah. I needed to kind of work my way through it. But I did notice that like in my community classes, my community classes were getting very busy. And, uh, and it was a donation-based class. And I was making pretty good money for a donation. Yeah. So I was like, okay, there seems to be something here. Because that class was doing well, they wound up offering me a class on the reg regular schedule at Sonic. And I've done most of my teaching there, all vinyasa yoga. But then fast forward to, you know, the eight, nine, almost 10 years that have ensued, I've been teaching all around the city. I've taught at at least five studios around New York. I think I'm on my sixth one now. Hmm. Um, 
I just love what yoga does. Sure. Um, yoga to me has been the answer to a lot of the questions that I've had about spirituality. Um, and I'm not like, I wouldn't consider myself a yogi. A yogi is someone who, you know, is on the path of yoga. I, I mean, I am. But having grown up with the spirituality that I did and the religion that I did, my journey over the years has just been to kind of like, I had this real epiphany about religion probably in my high school years where I'm like, as sure as my, let's say my parents are, that they are doing God's will and they are right with God. They are doing things the right way. The Muslims feel the exact same way. Mm. The Jews feel the yeah. exact same way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, uh, the, the Krishnas, the Mormons, they all think right. that they are doing <laughs> things yeah. wholeheartedly, mm -hmm. without a doubt. So what is that? And I say, well, there is the through line. And I ultimately equivalent it to, let's talk about most of the major religions. I think the essence of most of the major religions are try to come from a place of love, don't hurt people, don't kill people, um, do the right thing. I think that is the, is the, is the underlying you know, goal of, of all of that. So I, as a yogi or as a person who just likes to, to learn really, I call myself a religious prostitute. I just like, oh God. I'm all, I'm all, you know, if it were that term, <laughs> because you know exactly why that term, okay. just because, uh, you know, it's like, I take, my parents used a, a phrase, they didn't make this phrase up, but it's who mm -hmm. I heard it from, cafeteria Catholics. And it's just kind of like, like well, that. you know, yeah, I believe in like, don't kill people, but this whole sex before marriage thing, I'm not down with that. Yeah, so you're like, this. I'm going to take that. the milk, but the peas and carrots, I'm going to leave that alone. So, you know, and I, I, I do think that I can see why someone, if you're going to be wholehearted in any sort of religion, I can see that way of thinking. And yes, it's very convenient for you to say like, oh, well, I just don't believe in that part. Sure. Yeah. Um, maybe you're right though. Mm -hmm. And I think that's kind of how I treat religion and spirituality. Mm -hmm. I think there's so much to learn from everybody. I've been in basically like any religious building I can think of and like got on my knees and prayed along with whatever they were doing because I know the vibration behind what they're doing is all the same no matter where you go. Mm -hmm. It's just, you know, what is that being look like is it you is it in heaven yeah. is it uh you know is it an actual character or is it just an energy um was she a virgin was she not like yeah. who cares mm. the vibrational energy behind let's all come together forget about ourselves for a while and send our energy towards that greater something i'm down with that so it's like you know yoga is a philosophy and it's basically like, I think one of the things that scares people, my father, when I, he heard I was teaching yoga, he had obvious concerns as a, as a devout Catholic. Sure. Like, well, maybe I, you know, are you, are, oh, you're, are you like, you know, is that a religious thing? Are you like, you know, what is it? And I'm like, it's not, it's a philosophy. Now, I do think, and this gets into a sensitive topic about cultural appropriation. Because yeah. here I am, I'm a white guy teaching something that came from India. Mm -hmm. And I think yoga, the philosophy of yoga, crosses a line oftentimes with the Hindu religion. Sure. How could it not? Yeah. It, how could it not? Yeah, I yeah. mean, it's basically spawned from, you yeah. know. Um, and the philosophy of yoga can very black and white be pulled away from the religion. But what happens is, in modern day, people pull from the religion too. And you know, I can even say that I've been, I don't know if guilty is the right word, but as a Catholic, of course, I'm gonna use that word. Guilty of doing that myself. If there's like a mantra or something that really spoke to me, 
I do love to learn it. I also, you know, there's so many facets to why I love to learn it. Sure. Um, I love language, you know. If I go any country, I'm always trying to grab a couple phrases or at least, you know, please and thank you and maybe where is the bathroom. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think it's respectful, too. Yeah, to at least try. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Especially, you know, being a gringo from America. Like, do you speak English? It's just like... <laughs> Absolutely not. Like, yeah. at least say it in their language, mm -hmm. you know. Um, but I, so I love language. I, as a, as a singer, I love the power of vibration. I know that your your tenth cranial nerve, your vagus nerves, likes vibration. So if you just, mm, you're bringing yourself into that state of rest and digest, out of that state of fight or flight. So for all those reasons, and someone else has defined a chant, I love to learn that chant. Sure. You know, I, I, I'm careful with who and what I do it around because mm -hmm. I'm not doing it to be offensive or yeah. anything like that. It's just something that really speaks to me underneath my skin. And when I do it, it feels very right, so I love to do it. But getting back to my original point, the philosophy of yoga is simple, simply a way of living. The way that I learned right. it, it all comes down to the eight limbs of Ashtanga Yoga mm -hmm. that was brought about by Patanjali. Was it a person? Was it a group of people? Patanjali wrote the uh, Yoga Sutras, which were threads of wisdom, yeah. and brings us the philosophy of yoga as we know it today. There's, you know, most people when they think of yoga, they're like, oh, are you taking a Hatha class? Is it a vinyasa class? Style, yeah. It is a shtanga class. They're thinking, oh, do I do this pose instead of this pose? It actually has nothing to do with the poses. Right. Vinyasa, that's a different story. But like hatha to ashtanga to um, kundalini, it's more about the philosophies mm -hmm. and the way that you get to enlightenment. Sure. That's what's really different. Right. You could take an ashtanga or a vinyasa class and you wouldn't know the difference. But... If you get into the philosophies and you know the philosophies, that's where it's all very different. Totally. So the, the yoga that I know is all based in the Ashtanga philosophies, the eight limbs gotcha. of like practices of things that you should do, practices of things that you shouldn't do, uh, moving the body because your body has been given to you by God, by the universe. It's a gift. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't get a new bicycle and leave it out in the rain. You take care of that gift. Totally. You were given the gift of your breath. You use that because the belief is that we send energy throughout the body with the breath. It's called pranayama. Sure. And then you get into the different degrees of meditation. You know, and that's basically it. At no point is it, you know, you could say you're trying to get enlightened. You could say you're trying to connect with God. You could say you're trying to connect with your higher self. Um, I think that God is a different thing for everybody. Mm. Um, I have my own uh, take on God that has worked for me very well. Um, it, you know, it gets some frowns from some people. But so I was saying uh, God is different for every pe everybody. And uh, I've, I've got my own kind of take on what God is. But regardless of who God is to the yogi, if you will, um, you're trying to find the same thing that the Buddhist tradition tries to find. No suffering, right? Making it through life and suffering as little as possible. What that doesn't mean is avoiding things that happen that are bad. It means being mindful of your opinion on what is good and what is bad. I like the phrase that I always say when I'm teaching classes is in any given moment, two things happen. One thing happens and someone has an opinion on that thing that happens. We can only control one of those in most cases. Mm -hmm. So it's really working myself to not choose, especially I feel like modern day, people are so dramatic, myself included, mm -hmm. that we wanna make a film about ourselves and it's like hardships and treachery and woe is me and I think you know a lot of us left to our own devices that's the headspace we occupy is like we get ourselves into trouble with negativity and and downplaying ourselves and not being able to voice how we truly feel and what is actually going on and and not being able to say to another person hey you hurt me 
can we talk about that? Yeah. Even if it's somebody like on the subway. I actually, you know, I, I was walking up to these, I was walking up to the bench on the subway to sit down and this guy's got his legs way out like this. So I just kind of came in and gave him a little push uh -huh. and then sat back and he's like, you don't say excuse me? And he starts like going off of oh, no. like, you know, ah, oh, throw you off this train. And you know, <laughs> on the one hand, he did have a point. I, I could have very easily said, excuse me, and asked him to move his leg. There I am thinking that if it were me in his position, the moment I see somebody walk in, I'll put my bag on my lap, I'll close up my legs. I want them to feel, oh, he's moving so that I can sit down here. That's how I roll, yeah. right? I want to give you, and when I don't, it's because I don't want you to sit next to me. There have been time on the bus where I know there's other seats and I would prefer to not have to sit next to someone, so I leave my bag, but if you ask, I'm not gonna freak out about it. The point of the matter is, is he got very dramatic about the whole thing. And I wanted to say to him, are you really this offended by what I've done? Like, are you really, but you know, obviously. Yeah, you don't want to make it worse. Yeah, I don't want to make it worse. And who knows what's going on with his day? Like, yeah. it doesn't matter. But, right. but I also know that I've been him in, in other situations. Maybe, maybe not like in a public situation, but maybe at home, you know? Maybe with a, 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 someone I'm related to where I got very dramatic and I didn't need to. Yeah. And, also, and, and I can think of a time in particular that I got super dramatic and I didn't need to. And it's just like when you have tools that you don't have to react that way. You can if you want, but what if you had another option? And ultimately, like, that's what yoga brings me. I worked with this 13-year-old kid that, like I did, struggled with being too fidgety and not being able to stay still. His mom sent him to me to help him out with his problem. And I said, the first thing I said to him was, I don't want you to think that you have a problem because there's nothing wrong with the way you are. Mm. I said, I want you to have an option to be able to turn off and on that switch when you think it's appropriate. Wouldn't that be cool? And he's like, yeah, that sounds great. I think that's like, especially as someone who has struggled with being able to focus and pay attention, having a tool that helps me in that department is huge. Mm. And then there's like spirituality and you know, and connecting with something that is greater than myself that I think is, uh, it's important to, to realize that it's not just me and there is in some ways like a greater good, um, at least societally speaking, if not act in actuality, right? Like to exist, to exist in a society, I can't like club you over the head and take your wife and I can't shoot you and steal your car. Like mm -hmm. that's only because we can't exist as a society unless we establish those rules. Maybe there's a God involved that actually cares about that stuff too. I don't know 100% on right. that, but I do know that like, you know, connecting to a vibration. So you were, we were talking about what is my view of God? This is my view of God. And you know, it's not like, I don't think it's like controversial, but it does, <laughs> it does, it does offend some people. Oh. I say God is like a body of water heat controlled body of water and life is really hot sometimes and really cold sometimes. So if you want to be able to tolerate the extreme hots and colds, you get in the water and then the temperature's controlled. I think the mistake most people make is they're in the water and they're like, okay, I got God now. And they're like, God, I need a relationship. The water's like, I, I don't do relationships, and you're, but you're God, and it's like, but what I do is you may feel lonely sometimes, and you may be happy with a person that you're with. You also may have some ups and downs, lots of downs in that relationship. I can keep you from getting too hot and too cold through all that stuff. I don't give or take away that stuff from you. That's mm. just the laws of life. Um, but you can be okay if you stay in the water, regardless of what relationships you have. You know, God, I need a new job. God doesn't get you a job. God makes you okay, peaceful with yourself, whether or not you do or don't get that job. When you get the job and your boss is pissing you off or your coworkers not pulling their side of the slack, you can be okay and peaceful if you connect with the heat-controlled water. 
it's not a get me things sort of relationship that I know a lot of the people who I grew up with are praying to God for things. And there's a reason why I think this way. Uh, when I was in my teacher training, being the type A personality I am, did not miss a single day of my training. Uh, there was one day where I had to leave early because my sister, who had an operation on her ear, uh, she was having large, loud echoing and, uh, and volume fluctuations. So she got this operation done that had not been done many times before. They were operating from this way for most people. And with this particular operation they gave her, they opened her up and operated on the ear from this way. Um, everything went great. Three days later, my brother-in-law went to pick her up at the hospital. She was passed out on the floor. Uh, and she had a brain hemorrhage. Oh my God. So uh, she was in intensive care and they basically told us she's either going to die if we save, if she stays, if we don't do anything, if she lives, she'll be in a coma probably the rest of her life. If we perform this operation, which has a 50-50% success rate, uh, she could die or it could save her life and she could function again as a person. If we don't do anything, coma is the best case scenario. If we do do something, it could make her die or it could bring her back to a functioning person. Uh, so a lot of people were praying for my sister. And I said, really? Like, do you think there's someone up there like, huh, they're praying to me to heal this person. It's only 50 people. I was kind of hoping for 200. Mm. Mm. What should I do? Uh, I was gonna, I'll tell you what, I was actually gonna, I was gonna either leave her in a coma the rest of her life or I was gonna take her home. But I'll tell you what, I'll, I'll give you back to her. I'll give her back to you. Well, she wound up being paralyzed in the left side of her body, this is true. Did God say, well, I'll give her back to you, but she can't use the left side of her body anymore. Like. Do we pray to something to actually like, and then when we don't get what we want, it's like, well, God has a plan. It's like, I wish that the universe was that quantifiable of this like divine presence that was like making these small choices. I think that God is the force that allows my sister to persevere on to the hardships in her new life and allow her to be okay on some days because she connects to this energy of the, you know, heat controlled water. I think me who was very angry at this situation and feels that it's unjust, what is, what is justice? Um, but I don't think that I'm praying to someone or something to fix this. I'm praying to say, how do we make this work? And how do I stay peaceful no matter what? Maybe not no matter what, but as no matter what-ish as possible. And that's the God and the energy that I try to connect to and my the, the phone that I use is yoga. I say like, you know, religion ha is like, what, you use a red phone? Oh, I use a blue phone. You know, we don't need to fight about it. Yeah, but. sure. So that's, you know, that's basically the yoga in a nutshell. I think that we have, you know, like I said before, we have the tools of the body, the mind, the breath, and they're all to be used in prayer or meditation. I believe there's actual meditation. Meditation is good just to quiet the mind. Meditation is also good, and here's where you know it gets a little bit in a prayer. If I'm trying to quit smoking, and I meditate for 10 minutes every morning, what am I doing? I'm praying to something, saying, please don't, you know, you know, don't make me smoke. Maybe what I'm doing is thinking of the times where I know I'm gonna wanna smoke. And I preemptively, I'm saying, when this happens, here's the behavior I'm gonna choose. When I get this feeling, instead of doing this, I'm gonna do that. So if I'm not trying to clear my mind and find stillness in meditation, it's like planning for the game. It's like pulling up my playbook and saying, here's are the plays, the plays I'm gonna pull out. When I'm dealing with this like way of behavior, like this lashing out of anger or whatever, how do I reset that? So that as I move through my day, when it comes up, I'll, oh, here's that thing I was, pl I was planning in the quiet of my own thoughts earlier today. If I don't plan it in the quiet of my own th thoughts, it surprises me every time. And I don't take the action I wanna take. Mm. So like, there's another aspect of like how I personally use, you know, the practice of yoga to, uh, to, to, to focus my energies and goals. Like 
I'm not, I'm not meditating and because I meditate, I'm gonna succeed in life. I'm meditating on what patterns and behaviors am I gonna implement in my day so that when it comes time to do them, I'll do them or if I don't do them, I'll hold myself accountable to do it at the next convenient window. Mm. So a lot of stuff, uh, you know, that I love it with it. But like ultimately when I realized that yoga, I, because I was just doing the physical practice of yoga for years, when I realized, and the joke I say is, I realized when I do yoga, when I'm done with yoga, I'm a nice person mm. for maybe 10 extra minutes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not that long. Well, I know, I know. Sometimes, sometimes it was an hour or mm -hmm. a few hours. Sometimes it was an entire night. Yeah. I saw a direct yeah. correlation to the days that I practice yoga and then I don't. And then when you throw in the breath work and meditation, and to me those things are very crossover. Most yeah. people try to get into meditation and they can't. Start with breath work. Mm. It's, it's your better friend. It's something you're doing physically. A lot of meditation, yeah. people try to do nothing. It's like, yeah, good luck. Mm. Choose something that's better than the mind racing, which is focus on the breath, count the breath, listen to the breath, whatever you're gonna do with the breath. But the breath is a big part of it. But yeah, just using those tools to help you be a more effective person. And then I was finding for myself, well, if it's making me a better person, if I can be a decent person, and this direct correlation between the days I practice and don't practice, I really was like, that's when I wanted to share it with other people. I'm like, if it can help me out, mm. it, it, it can help other people out. And you know, I'm still a normal person. That's why I say, am I a yogi? I'm a really normal person that uses the tool of yoga to make me a better person. And I share that with other people. That's what I do. It's like, yeah. I don't know if I'm, I'm definitely not a guru. I'm not like, I eat meat, I drink Diet Coke, yes. you know? I mean, I'm not, I, like I do eat healthy, wholesome foods as well. Yeah, hopefully. Like the basis, <laughs> the basis of my diet is healthy food, mm -hmm. but I'm, I'm not like a vanilla person. Mm -hmm. Like <laughs> I've got, I mean, I, you, you know, you were asking, I actually don't drink, it's a choice that I've yeah, made. Yeah. I don't, I don't do any drugs or anything. Coffee is my only, you know, vice, and perhaps I do it more than maybe I should. Although, you know, what is that? It's just a personal thing. Mm -hmm. um, I'm always cutting back on my caffeine intake. Mm. Uh, but um, I think you can drink and and do drugs and still be a spiritual functioning person. Like I'm not condemning any of that. Yeah. Some of that stuff I've decided doesn't work for me. But my point is, I think for me to be effective in my role, I need to be a real person who has found something that helps me be a better real person. And that's ultimately what I do as a yoga teacher. Mm. So. Wow, there's your piece right there. <laughs> there, 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 there it is, you know, it, uh, mm. it's, it's really, it's really helped me. And, and I do want to finish to say, it's also, very helpful to realize that because we talk about falling off the horse and I think the mistake most people make with yoga is they try to do yoga an hour five days a week even three days a week for some people is a lot to ask if you could do 10 to 15 minutes five days a week of yoga so that equivalating to like 90 minutes of yoga a week you're better off doing that yeah. finding like go to classes Figure out which pose you feel like, oh, my shoulders are tight. And when I do those poses, right. they, it, may, it works my shoulders. I should do those poses. And that's, you come up with like three to five poses that you're going to do more days than not. And you're better off doing that. Find some quiet time in your day. Sit down. And sometimes it, it's while you're practicing yoga. You know, you just turn everything off and just listen to your breath as you move or as you hang out in a pose. And I will tell you this, that, well, the first thing I want to say is, Yoga to me is like a vitamin. You don't take a vitamin a month ago and try to figure out why it stopped working. You gotta pretty much take it every day. Does that mean you need 10 vitamins every day? No, you just gotta take that one small vitamin every day and let that be effective for you. And I think that, um, forget what I was gonna say. Um, oh, the mistake that most, well, what I already said is the mistake that most people make is they put too much pressure on themselves to do this huge thing. Right. And it's just finding a little bit of time in every one of your days to move through the body a little bit. If you have a job that you sit down for long periods of time in, stand up every once in a while. 
if you have a job that you're standing up for long periods of time and sit down. The mistake everybody made is they bought stand-up desks because sitting was the new smoking. And then they've got other problems because they're standing at it all the time. Yeah. I think the trick of the matter is, is if you're doing any one thing all the time, it starts to hurt. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Move yourself Gotta around. Mix it yeah. up. So that's, that, that's my uh, soapbox for yoga. Yeah. I think it can be an effective tool for anyone. And if it can work for me, being the cynical person that I am, I even tapped in some of that rainbow's <laughs> unicorn's goodness because I do think that maybe, like, do I think that I have seven energy centers that have the colors of the rainbow as you go bottom to the top? I don't know. I don't know because I've never actually seen them. I've mm. imagined them. Um, I've pictured them in my mind's eye. Sure. But I also know that the imagination is a powerful tool. Mm. And if like we were being spoken to by some like divine being, we'd probably hear it through what most people would call your imagination. Oh, it's just your imagination, it's not God. Well, maybe they could be one and the same. So with the uh, rainbows and unicorns, as I keep defining it, sometimes, yeah, those are tools just to spark up your imagination and that might be a faster way for you to get where you want to go than rather rather than technically understanding how it all works mm. sometimes it's a shortcut these yeah. like you know uh subtle body tools sure. uh that that help us spark up the imagination have you had i mean any say transcendent experiences on the mat like anything Actually, the thing I forgot yeah. that I was going to say is, is what you're asking me now is... <laughs> Great. <laughs> thank you for that. <laughs> uh, there have been times in my life that I've been... I've seen the Great Pyramids in Egypt. I've been to India, to the Ganges River, whitewater rafting. Um, I'm trying to think of some like really... Zip lining through Thailand. Done some pretty amazing fun experience, had some amazing fun experiences. And one could say in those moments that I was as happy as I will ever be in my life. I will tell you that I have been as happy as those other experiences on my mat, in my meditation or moving through my body. I've been as happy on my mat, in my meditation or moving my body as I have been doing anything else in my life. To say this, those other things are great and I would not change those experiences for the world. And I will do them again, some of them, and explore new ones. Mm -hmm. And I think that's healthy. And I think we need that to a certain degree. But if we can't have it, we can still get there. Mm -hmm. Everything that I need to be happy, I have. I don't need any more financially Yes, I do believe that money is a necessity of life. And I do believe that when you can afford things, it removes certain stresses from your life, like eating or having a place to live. Yes, 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 yes. But I do think that sometimes I can get a little bit lost in the things that I have or the ex things that I'm doing. Or sometimes like since the pandemic, I haven't, I've traveled locally, but I haven't traveled all that much and almost like feeling bad about that. And it's like, yeah, but I've been as happy as that. So who the cares? Yeah. Like you have, we have more tools available to us sitting in your apartment, clearing some space on the floor and moving your body around. And when you can really, and, and this is like this, it took me years okay. to get here. I can really move and connect with breath, body, and mind and have that be the only thing going on in my life. The joke I make is no romance, finance, and circumstance as you're moving through your yoga practice. Yeah. Those things you're not thinking about, oh, my taxes are due in a month and I haven't called up my uh, tax attorney, right? You're in chair pose and you're like, oh, this is really hard. That's a gift, mm -hmm. you know? And, and, and when you use that gift, it can really simplify things for your average individual. Mm -hmm. So have I had transcendent moments? To me, that's it. Just this like, they say that uh, musicians and dancers have this gift. When you play music, why are you playing music? Not to get to the end of the piece or else everyone will play the music as fast yeah, as possible. Right, right. right, when you're dancing, where are you trying to get? Nowhere, you're moving your body. So in those two examples, it's about having the experience. And I think this is life. Yes. It's about having the experience. Yes, you're like, yes, 
you you want a miracle you're here you're a conscious being having this experience like uh, and yeah i mean i could just go on and on but um I, th I think that that's as much of a transcendent experience that I need. I I've lost myself so completely that I'm just like, I forget even that I was doing what I was doing. Mm. I'm like, oh yeah, that's right. Like I'll look at the time and I know some people when they take my class, there's like 45 okay. minutes left. <laughs> We've only been in this 15 minutes. How is this possible? Sometimes when I'm practicing and it's taken me a long time to get here and especially as someone who struggled with focus, it's to like forget about time for a little while and just be like, I've been doing this for 75 minutes. It feels like 45. To me, that's a gift. That's a gift of just being fully present in what you're doing and forgetting all else. You know, can't do it all the time. Yeah. Life's got responsibilities. But do you try to do that for 10, 15 minutes of your day? And most people will say, well, it's too, like to sit down and quiet my thoughts is too hard. It's like, Lifting a 150 pound weight is hard, but people will work up to it. Right. It's, it's, you know, it's a prioritization. If it's not important for you, you know, the crazy fun arm balances and handstands that I can do, I don't think everyone needs to do those. And they, I only do them because they're fun for me. Mm -hmm. But I've put effort into them. And if you put a little bit effort into yourself, you're gonna get some payoff. Sure. If you put no effort into yourself, you get no payoff. If you're fortunate enough to enjoy putting effort into yourself, you're going to discover more and more miracles daily, I think. Yeah. Then I was like, stuff I want to ask you, you actually brought up a lot of this stuff on your own. Um, but then there's like pieces that I want to get into. And one is from a few minutes ago, you're saying how you can find, say, happiness with, you know, your, uh, your, your movement practice, your breath, your mind, sort of all those things integrating. And I think a lot of people, I mean, that are in a fortunate position that have, say, like financial means, let's say, in one dimension, they, they have a lot of things in their life, material goods, but they lack any source, any, any t sense of peace or any sense of happiness. You know, there's, you've maybe heard of this thing that there's a meaning crisis right yeah. now. Um, and it's bizarre in a way because you would assume that and this is most people, and of course there's people at the bottom, poor people that are suffering materially, but let's talk about sort of the average person, someone that's not worried about where the next meal's coming from. They don't have that kind of peace. A lot of people don't have that kind of peace, right? A lot of people are struggling to find that. And I think yoga is perhaps one of many avenues to, to find that, or For at least sure. get that started in, in your life, right? So would you, would you agree that I know this is like a very, this is like 20,000 foot view or whatever, but yeah, of course. do you think that there is um, a meaning crisis right now? Do you think there is, that people are struggling to find? I do, especially that? I think with the blow up on social media, okay. media and entrepreneurship and things like that. Mm. Like, I think a lot of people now have a lot of pressure to find meaning mm. to why. Like, what's my why? Like, yeah. that's a big question. And I do think, I think those are effective tools. I think it's good to ask, like, wh wh what do I want to promote? What do I want to do with myself? Mm. But I think if you, if, you, if you start with, like, what do I believe in? What does this all mean for me? Um, it can help guide you in that direction. I do think that, like, some people are putting a lot of pressure to find, like, that game winning meaning on their life that may or may not be for them, but they see other people doing it and they feel like, oh, that's what I need to do now. Like, I need to be uh, an influencer. I need to like, yeah, I mean, in the yoga world, uh, there's a lot of people on social media feeling really bad about themselves because they don't have a, a good following or, or something like that. I see, and I see it with my nieces and nephews. I, I didn't mention you. I've got, like, between great nieces and nephews, something like 25. Oh my goodness. I, I have to, like, write them all down so I get an accurate <laughs> number. I know everybody by face, yeah, but sometimes well, I'm like, you, wait, because, like, oh, wow. I won't see them for six months, and the next one is, looks older, and then the one below them sure. looks older, so. But, um, is... Wait, what the hell was I just saying? I totally lost my People train. People social media. And so, oh, just yeah. watching my nieces and nephews. Oh, yeah, uh, 
the pressures that they experience of mm. like, you know, it used to be you thought that nobody liked you. Now they're telling you on your on your <laughs> Instagram account <laughs> or your TikTok or whatever yeah, it is you're on, you sure. know? It's like one out of every five videos is someone explaining how they don't give a shit about what this person said about them. So anyway, but there's a lot of pressure, I think. Is this, is this what you're meaning about yeah. the meaning? Yeah. There's a lot of pressure, I think, on people to find meaning and to make their mark and stuff like mm. that. But I do believe that like our meaning, I think it's good to acquire things. I think it's good to have things. I think having luxurious things is fun. Yeah. It can't be your end goal because I think you're going to just keep needing it and realizing that that hole will never get filled. And more people that I know, it just becomes the endless chase. And they never say like, yeah, like I have enough right now. Right. I don't struggle with the materialistic stuff. But, you know, the, like for me, it's maybe technology. Like I always want like the new yeah. coolest device. But if that becomes my purpose, it's going to be a very empty purpose. Because as we know, Apple's coming out with a new phone like every six months, yeah, you yeah. know. So it, that can't be your purpose. I think it's, it's the balance of both. Like we need, it's nice to have nice things. I would say it's better to at least be able to feed yourself, have shelter, like that is a requirement we need and then anything over and above is for the individual to decide right. but there also needs to be an element of spirituality and if there's too much spirituality in none of this other stuff that's why i think a lot of monks become monks and priests become priests because it's hard to do it as a part-time job mm. but like the the bodhisattva it, he goes you can't if, if you become, you know, me as a yoga teacher feeling like I found, I don't, I don't think I'm enlightened. I think I have more peace of mind than I used to have. And if, if I'm not given, if I run to a cave and never see anybody again, well, what's that doing for society? Mm. I do think that is important. And yeah. this gets into the uh, Alfredian theory of like needing to feel like we're contributing to society. So do we need to have this big boom meaning? No. Do we need to feel like we're doing something that is meaningful to society? Yes. I think most people need to have meaning that fulfills their ego more than society. And I don't think that's totally a bad thing. I do think we should feel fulfilled by ourselves, by the things we do. But if we focus on the fact that it's really helping other people out, that's when it becomes beneficial. So I think the meaning should be for most of us to find the balance between the spiritual side for mm -hmm. ourselves yeah. and the stuff side, whether that be actual finance or friends or the nice looking job or the nice looking whatever. Like I think, I think, I think on both sides of things you can go too far. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we were talking about the chakras the chakras are energy centers that have to do with like, so my root chakra, am I a grounded person or am I all over the place? Do I make plant, do I double book myself all the time? Well, then I need to like root into that root chakra. If I'm too much in my crown chakra, I'm all over the place. I'm, you know, forgetting that I scheduled the meeting. I'm not brushing my teeth. I forgot to shower. Like I'm just too busy and too airheaded all the time. Well, one of the things we're trying to do is bring balance to all of the energy centers of the body, but in a very like hands-on real way, we're trying to balance who we are. Mm. If you're too spiritual, you might run into problems because wait, I haven't eaten in a month and now I got to become a beggar. I know that's a choice for some people and that's a choice. But if you find yourself with no finances because you're a yogi who's doing yoga all the time, you got problems. But if you're not taking care of yourself at all, spiritually, physically, mentally, emotionally, you're gonna run into problems too. I think your best person tries for everything and realizes that balance is a moving target. There's no such thing as balanced. Mm -hmm. It doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. Balance sometimes means work too hard and don't take care of yourself physically. Right. And then that pendulum needs to swing the other way or you're gonna get into sickness and you're gonna have aches and pains. I think a lot of the, our society who has a lot of money now they need to pay all their money in healthcare because they weren't taking care of themselves. Right. But they have money. So where's the balance? Sure. Fortunately, my parents, they've been going to the Y for years now. My dad never exercised. 
he had a physical job for most of his life, but towards the end years, he didn't. He had a desk job, and it's nice to see him taking care of himself. Absolutely. So the meaning is we're here having the experience. Anything past that, serve society and have fun while you're doing it. Mm. And it's that simple, mm. but we put a lot of pressure on ourselves to make it like look shinier and, and better. Yeah, I like the way you put it, um, a game-changing meaning. Yeah. That's a funny, that's for a, sure. That's a funny, because yeah, I think there is. They want to find the unicorn, right? Yeah, there's this, um, and I wonder how, it's impossible to tell, right? Because we can only, the only thing we have access to is this, our own lives, our own experience. For sure. This one, right? Right. If there are, if we reincarnate and we've had other ones, they're I not really. I haven't seen any proof. They're not, not accessible to right, us right. You know, readily, right? Right, for sure. I'm, I'm open to that possibility. Yeah, I'm totally open to it. Um, but there's. I wonder if it's a modern, more of a modern problem, this like egoic, this like self, like we're so self-involved, self-interested, yeah, you know what sure. I mean? And it's a well, partly Western thing, yeah. partly technology, it's all these things that kind of are adding up. And I wonder if that's, you know, really... Well, we want things that other people want by yeah, default. Yeah, so you see, social, everyone's yeah. like, I'm, you know, I'm my own boss now. I'm, you know, it's yeah, just like, yeah. and being your own boss is is really cool. But then people put it. Well, no, I can't just. I want to be, you know, Gary V. Yeah, you know, everybody yeah, yeah. wants I to be Gary V. Be. And Gary V. wants everybody to be Gary V. <laughs> you know, and, and I think and I think he's great. It's like he has some I mean, great yeah. stuff to I say, and I yeah. and I follow him. Like I think he has yeah. very valid stuff to say. Um, but now everyone's like, now I have to be like that. Right. You know, or Tony Robbins is and another perfect example. you might hate example. being that. You, you might, might hate, hate the process that. of doing that. Like, yeah, there's like people, like creators, influencers, people who try to create content and they might look at sort of what the big people are doing, you know. And uh, I'm not going to say anything bad about what the top creators are doing because yeah. they're successful, they're, do they're doing For it well. Sure. But like if you try to copy what they're doing and you hate it, and what's you know, the point? What's the point? Yeah, you're not doing yourself a certain, you know, it's, you're, you're defeating the purpose. So. My social media following is not amazing by any chance. I had like a video go viral or whatever on TikTok. Yes. Um, and, and when it happened, it was cool because I was like, I was like not into TikTok. I had like 500 followers. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden, they, I was go getting up into the thousands and nice. I'm like, what, all off one video. Yeah, and it wasn't like I posted other videos similar and whatever the algorithm <laughs> snatched up on, who knows. But I, 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 underst I understand that feeling. You know, it's like when you win gambling. It's yeah. like, well, I get it. Um, but I've been fortunate enough that like I enjoy posting on social media, not that I post all the time. Be, from having an audio engineering background, knowing how to video edit, I know some yeah. Adobe After Effects. I think it's fun to put stuff and and get the likes and the comments on it, but my identity's not wrapped up in it. Yeah. So That's good. That's you know, I, I feel blessed for that because yeah. I see other people who struggle with it, and they're like, you know, lamenting how and some people post about it, especially on TikTok. Nobody likes my videos. It's like. <laughs> Life's hard. Yeah, you're <laughs> like, gonna fail a lot. You're gonna so fail a lot, and it, ultimately, yeah. you can quit at any time. Yeah, like yeah, you, you want don't have to. to do, if you, you don't have like it. Yeah. Anyway, to move on, there's a lot of different options. So available. there's a lot of pressure to find meaning in this world. It's but what's interesting. One of the interesting things you said a few minutes ago too was, do you would you say that people need a spiritual outlet? That people need to have spirituality in their lives. I do think yeah. that they need to have some sort of spirituality in their lives. Mm. I won't readily tell everybody that fact. Mm. I, I would say things more like mindfulness, even when I, even my spirituality, some people say I'm just like more new age thinking. I do believe that like the God that is around or the energy, it's, it's all within us too. Mm -hmm. And I think the only way that you can make a change is not by praying to something, but taking action. Right, right. So, so yeah, I think it's, you know, it exists on all planes of existence. Mm. I don't know, did I answer your question? Yeah, no, you, you did. You, because I, I wanted to get, yeah, sort of <laughs> firm answer on yeah. if you think that it's a necessary, because some people, you know, I think a lot of, Secular folks would say, "You can have a fulfill. You can have a complete life. Let's say a happy life without any spiritual dimension at all." I, I want, I, I'm, I'm like, perhaps a little skeptical. 
Yeah, I'd, I'd say it's maybe really hard to. Yeah, I would well, say. this like is what I want to say. You can get it, but maybe it's easier to have something that you can. You, to have a spiritual component, maybe. I, I do think it's effective. easier. Yeah, I yeah, think it's, it's I think that's more effective more and pragmatic, easier. But here's here, here's ultimately what I think because I wanna I wanna I wanna say that again. Yeah. I think I use certain tools of connecting with, let's say, stillness, quiet, breath, be, listen to what? Oh no. When I have these moments of connection transcendence if you will and i'm not talking anything grandiose i'm saying when i feel okay just to be for me i define that as a spiritual connection mm. you could do everything that i'm doing without connecting to like saying any sort of like god or great spirit or energy or you could do the mindful things that i do and not define any of it as spirituality. And I do believe that you could get all the benefits that I get. Mm. I connected to a greater energy. I feel like there's something vibrational that's like passing through all things. Uh, we call it like a divine consciousness. Mm -hmm. I believe that. But I think you can do all the things that I do, which are not praying necessarily to anything, mm. but more like just being and connecting to whatever that thing is and that thing might just be the quiet of your own thoughts i think you can get a lot of benefits and maybe even all the benefits that mm. i get i do think it's easier when you know the reason why i think god exists is we need to put a face on something mm. you know it's like we need to give it a character and a, a label just so we can talk about it or express it to another person or because it makes us it makes it easier for us to understand it. The moment we talk about any of this stuff, the meaning is, you know, cloudy because sure. words can't really express. On the interview that I was watching with you today, and you asked him to share about his transcendent experience, and he's like, it's really hard to define, and that's the thought that came to my mind. The moment, like, I've had those moments where I saw the universe. I really, really feel like, call me crazy, but I really feel like that I have. And I could explain some of it, but really what I can't explain is that it's here. I'm here. This is happening. It's now. This is all things. This is everything. And you're like, what does that even mean? It's like, if I try to explain it, it's not going to make any sense anyway, except that it's a feeling of just be. And that's ultimately like, you know, when you get into the Atman, you know, the, the, this, the true self, that's what it's all about. You know, you dig down beneath the five layers of who we think we might be. You're conscious. You're this thing that has thoughts and those thoughts change. So you're not your thoughts because the thoughts can change. Th opinions that you had as a child have changed as an adult. Things that you used to believe in, maybe you don't believe in. Things you, you believe in now, you didn't believe in. So your ideas, your thoughts, who I am changes. So that's not who you are because who you are is a constant thing. You're simply the observer, the consciousness beneath it all. And this is where we get into like, what is God? Well, you have that beneath it all. Like if you took your, if you took your face off and put it down, you could, you'd survive for a while. You'd still be you. <laughs> yeah. So you're not your face. If you cut your hand off, your hand's not back at you looking sure. at you. So there are removable parts from you. If someone goes into a coma, well, they've lost their cognitive abilities. Are they still not them? At some point they stop being them, but well then where was the true essence? And that's what people say is God. And your God is the same as my God because once yeah. we strip away all the layers, yeah. your isness, I'm isness, we're all isness. So who's the real God? Anyway, spirituality, yeah, it helps. Spirituality, <laughs> it's useful. Yeah, it's hard to go it alone, I think. I think too. it is harder, hard to go it alone. Just like it's easier to have accountability partners, right? right? right. If, if, you're trying to, if you're trying to, you know, I'll use the example of quitting smoking because I did something like 14 years ago. Hardest wow. thing I ever did in my life. Oh my God, yeah. hardest thing I ever did in my life. But when you have people that are helping you hold yourself accountable, mm -hmm. it's much easier. Yeah. And when, what happens when people are, aren't around? Well, connect to that spiritual realm and that's the accountability for you as well. Gives you an extra layer of, yeah, glue. Yeah, I agree. The thing too, you mentioned earlier, um, this idea 
I don't think you use this phrase, but a lot of people do. Sort of like spiritual, not religious. Yeah. It's like, you know, for kind sure. of, uh, I've heard people use like, uh, actually yoga instructor, my, one of my first yoga teachers back in Massachusetts, she said something of the effect of one. So she, she treated it as like sort of a buffet. Yeah. You know, you kind of like, I like this. Yeah. I like this. I like this. But I will say when she said it to me in my head, I shouldn't judge. <laughs> But like my, I had like a judging thought where I thought, and actually I still I, I still think I still think this, so maybe it's something I have to work on. But not to judge, just to have the thought, you know. Yeah, yeah sure. To to look at it a little critically, and this might, might be a sort of a Catholic kind of a grounding thing. It always is, man. That <laughs> it's an impossible thing to separate, right? Yeah. But like if you if it if you're treating it that way in terms of the things you're taking, I think there's a cost too. That's like my, my some that's 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 my going more working theory is that, like it's you can't just take, and also you have it takes something of you as For well. For sure, like it's a two way. Yeah, it's not like you get. It's to an say, exchange. Yeah, it's not like just like I like this, just take that like this, but, you know, I won't do the the other half where I have to, to take out of part of myself. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's like. Um, it's like taking all the pleasant parts, perhaps. It's like a hijack. Negative. You're yeah. hijacking. And I mean, maybe that, I, I, I didn't go into dialogue with her about it, so yeah. she, she might have the same kind of opinion, but, because um, otherwise, yeah, hijacking, I think that's a good way to put it, of putting it, of just sort of like, it's like a greedy way of being yeah. like, I only want the good stuff. Right, for sure. All the cost, because I don't think if you don't, you know, pay a price a bit. If you, There's if gotta if be some work giving, involved. Yeah, there has to be some action involved. For right? sure. Like this, the, the idea of, um, they're just saying, like, I believe, and that's enough. Like, I've just always thought, is this, yeah. yes, it's just not, no. Right. <laughs> it's a walking, it's a, you have to walk it. Yeah. You know, instead of just doing the talk, so. You gotta dig, dig in there. Yeah. In order for it to, I think, be effective and actually make you effective. Yeah. But I think it's easier <laughs> to just be like. Yeah, it's easier, but also easier for how long, right? Yeah. Because if you're, if you're, you know, not, looking at what's actually there, the truth, then you're gonna pay for it at some point. You know what I mean? You're always yeah. gonna pay the price. For sure, yeah, for sure. <laughs> you, could pay, you could pay it consciously, you could pay it, you, you know, dutifully. Yeah. Or you can pay it later because you didn't pay it early. You know what I mean? It's mm -hmm. like this. That's, yeah, sooner or later. Yeah, it's gonna come back. It's gonna to come you. back at you, for sure. Um, Kundalini yoga, you had mentioned yeah. before. Do you have any experience with Kundalini? A little bit, a yeah. little bit. Only went to a few classes. Okay. I mean, the general, the idea behind it is Kundalini is like a coiled up snake at the bottom of your center channel of energy, which is called the Shishumna Nadi, which is, parallels the spine. This dormant energy is trapped at the bottom of your spine, and you do spiritual work to release that energy, to charge up the entire center channel of energy. And when the energy goes from the root to the crown through all seven chakras, and there's a masculine and feminine energy channel that pass through all seven chakras, and then eventually go to the top, you uh, become enlightened. So you do things like uh, kriyas, kriyas are actions. Mm -hmm. So in yoga, we're like hanging out in a warrior too, and that's a pose, a kriya, you're going like, hut. Hut, yeah, hut, over, over, a lot of twists, yeah, yeah. a lot of breath work. Um, you're all trying to free this dormant energy trapped at the bottom of your spine to become enlightened. And the reason why they wear the turbans is so that they don't go crazy because it helps ground them down. Oh, That's one of the reasons. I mean, yeah. there's a, a humility thing with God in some cases, but uh, yeah, it's to help, help them to ground that energy that otherwise would just go flying out the crown chakra. Interesting. Yeah. Um, I so again, it's a different approach to yoga where I am more adhere to the Ashtanga principles. Um, that is just a different way of different phone. Yeah. Uh, getting it's. I don't love it. Uh, I sometimes will incorporate bits of Kundalini into my vinyasa, mm. adding in a kriya or two. Uh, but for the most part, I'm, I'm more of a uh, Ashtanga slash Ashtanga philosophy vinyasa type of practice. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Totally. I actually, the first time I took a Kundalini class, I was like, what 
are they going to start doing the yoga? Like yeah, they it's were not doing like exercise. Yeah, you're, you're usually working up a sweat. Yeah, right? it's yeah. Well, you do, but it's yeah, it's not exercise. Yeah. In the tr- like you'll you'll lie on your back and then pump your hips to the ground for like yeah. five minutes. You know, because you're trying to free I've up a little bit. Your sacred yeah. chakra. Yeah, it's I think a, it's interesting. I it's think very the, interesting. Um, the mystical. It really leans into. You know, they have kundalini awakenings, yeah. so that can be, you know, visions yeah. kind of like really intense. And I've heard, like, I brought it up to a few yoga instructors, and oftentimes the response is, you got to be careful with that. It's yeah. kind of uh, weird stuff yeah. starts happening. Well, and that's why before I was saying yeah. nuts and bolts, rainbows and unicorns, yeah. they're, they're way over on the yeah. rainbows and unicorns yeah. side. Not to discredit the experience, oh, I no. just and and honestly, I've done the practice and received similar benefits from mm. it. But I also like the workout aspect of vinyasa yoga. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, like the breath work you uh, you've done pranayama, yeah. right? Yeah. And um, could you tell the audience like what that is? Like pranayama that? is basically uh, prana means life force energy, mm. um, and then yama is to guide. Mm. Uh, yeah, to, to basically to do. Uh, in the Ashtanga practice, you have your yamas and your, let me, you have your yamas and your niyamas. Yamas is to restrain, actually. Oh. Yamas is to restrain. So the niyamas are the things you're supposed to do, and the yamas are the things you're not supposed to do, like be angry, be hateful, oh, okay. steal from people. So you're restraining your breath. You're moving your breath into the different energy channels of the body. Okay. And the life force energy rides in on the breath. So the belief is that when you guide this prana through your body, you are, one, taking care of yourself health-wise, but also spiritual-wise. You're literally bringing this life force energy through in, within and without yourself. In the yoga practice, so kundalini, shashumna nadi I told you about, masculine and feminine energy lines, well, in, in, in all of yoga, there are actually those lines are all over the body, like 72,000, I think they say, and they extend beyond the skin of these what are called nadi lines, energy lines. And ultimately what you're trying to do with the breath is send the energy through all these energy lines mm. so that you can have a long, healthy life because enlightenment takes a long time and you need as much life to get there as you possibly can. So uh, modern day, it works wonders, pranayama works wonders with depression, helping people to be more energized when they're feeling depressed. Mm -hmm. If people are anxious, it helps them to uh, ground themselves to be less anxious. Helps if you're sleepy, it wakes you up. If you're too awake, it can slip. Since I've been doing breath work, I I can fall asleep in like five to 10 minutes when I lay down in my bed. Uh, if I'm if I'm struggling, um, I used to struggle a lot with sleeping. Uh, doing a simple box breath, and I'm usually out in like five ten minutes. Wow. So yeah, prana prana pranayama, move you move life force energy through the body with the power of your breath. And there's many different techniques to do it. The box breath is five in, five out. Five it, in, yeah, you can switch the like, count yeah, out. It's, four, uh, it's usually yeah. four, four, oh, four, 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 okay. or five, five. Some people like. When I'm doing the, uh, when I'm trying to sleep, I do an eight count breath. Uh, but like ultimately I say, are we talking one, two, three, four, five, or one, <laughs> yeah, how two, three, because the three counts a long yes. time. So, so yeah, I mean, I would say you want at least like a three second breath sure. uh, yeah. and then a three second hold, three second exhale, three second hold. Is there overlap with pranayama and um, what is it, holotropic breath work? For sure. Is yeah, it I've similar, gone to, it's, it, it's same, same. Same, same, I mean, okay. Uh, with the holotropic, you're going more for, you know, <laughs> the woohoo factor of it yeah. all. Like, you, you're high as a kite. Like, I do some of that. Like, the Wim Hof method. Yeah. It's incredible, you know. Mm. It's, like, especially from a person that used to, I'll say, dabble with drugs. Um, it's it's your cheapest, freest, uh, most natural way to get high. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, when you're doing this breath work, like, I did a holotropic uh, breath work workshop down in the village and I felt like I was floating off floating off the ground like there was tinglys and all mm. like heart meridians and like my hands my fingers were all stretching out and it felt like something was taking over my body you know I, I, I don't know if anything any of that is true and at the end of the day who cares it felt like it 
um, and yay. <laughs> so, yeah. so the holotropic can really help, really help with anxiety too though. Mm. I use the Wim Hof method when I'm feeling a little stressed out. The interesting thing about it is it induces anxiety. Mm. So you kind of live through that ang- anxious state and then when you get to the other side and you're like, nothing matters no more. Right. It's You've great. Consciously yeah. chosen to put yourself right. into that difficult yeah. situation and then you got to the other side. So very, yeah. very powerful. So yeah, the holotropic is, is, I think it has spiritual effects too, but I think modern day most people are using it because it kind of feels like you're high. High on your own supply. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. It totally. is good. I, I've, I've dabbled in it as well. I don't know why I haven't come back to it. That's a good question. Interesting. But I've liked it. I yeah, mean, I've always loved been... It. It's like a lot of things. You fall off the wagon, then you forget it. And you well, and ultimately, it. like, we, we can only prioritize so much. Mm, mm. You know, you're always making a choice. Yeah. It's just what's most important to you. Yeah. Like... You know, when I'm doing handstands and people are like, oh, I wish, or play the guitar. When I play the guitar, people are like, oh, I wish I played the guitar. I say, no, you don't. When I wished I could play the guitar, I picked up a guitar and started playing. This, uh, what you want to want it. Yeah. If you wanted it, you'd do the work. Yeah. If you want to want it, that's called a wish. I wish I could play the guitar, but if you wanted to play the guitar, you'd pick up a guitar and start suffering through the. I wish I could play the guitar. Yeah. <laughs> I have, but no, I actually have put a lot of time into trying to learn to play guitar, and I'm just so bad at it. It's tough. It is tough. I wonder, but I remember during the pandemic, that was like an early pandemic thing for me because I was stuck at home. Nothing much else to do. So What'd I, you do? Like jump on YouTube and just like? No, I actually used. I primarily used a uh, this app called Musician. Have okay. you ever heard of it? Mm. Yeah, our new sponsor, Musician. <laughs> Try to get some ad dollars for them. Right. Uh, it's actually a great app. I can always okay. say positive things. It's basically Guitar Hero, but you don't need. It just uses the mic on your app on your um, on your iPad or on your computer, yeah, and cool. you can follow along and play along to the tune. You know, it's just like Guitar Hero, but with yeah. an actual guitar or ukulele, or a piano. And so I used that a lot, for, I mean, like two hours a day for a few months. I was playing every day, trying. That's and amazing. My, yeah, and it was fun. It was fun at for, for a while, but my level of improvement was so minuscule. Yeah. Where I could tell it was gonna take me years to play like a simple song well. And I literally was like, I have to just stop because this is not for me. <laughs> well, like, and then you know, you're like, well, and that's decided, it. You, yeah. you reprioritize yeah, because yeah. you realize the, 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 the cost. price. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it yeah. was too expensive. Um, I will tell you, though, like, usually what happens with the guitar is it's like slow going, slow going, slow going. And all of a sudden you're like, Enjoy. I'm getting good fast. Okay. And then what happens to most people is and then it's slow going, slow going, slow going. It all depends on what you, why you want to play. Yeah. You know, if you're really trying to like shred or something, like I can't do any of that. Yeah. What I can do, I can finger pick and strum, that's but cool. I can play chords to mm. sing along to. Yeah. And I think that's ultimately what I wanted. Yeah. You know, the other stuff that I learned, yeah, I wanted to learn it, but you can, you can do some basic stuff that's really fun and nice. Mm. Um, but yeah, you got to break through that first. So get the app back out. Where's your guitar? It's not here. It's at my parents' house. Uh, <laughs> I didn't even bring it. No, I think there's a lot of other things I would like to get into. Like dancing is actually one. It's funny you say it's so much fun, you're a man. dancer. I like, I enjoy dancing. Poor, I'm not a good dancer. It doesn't matter. I know, I know it doesn't matter, but um, you do want to, I'd love to do some dance classes and kind of like learn and you know, get into the flow. Have you ever tried swing dancing? No. Do you have a girlfriend? <laughs> No, I do. I do that. Okay. Oh, I say it like that. <laughs> uh, I'm very single. <laughs> it's another word from our sponsor. Uh, no, because I will tell you, like when I even I used to take ballet classes. Yeah. I used to take tap classes, and I used to swing dance. Sure. And people would tease me about it. My little, my kid brother actually started crying when he found out I did ballet, because that meant I was gay. Oh jeez. Right. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, he was he was very young at the time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but long story in short is, you're a straight male in a room full of, you know, yeah, great ratio. 20 yeah. beautiful women, mm-hmm. and the other three guys are gay. Well, when you go out swing dancing, it's not quite like that, but if you can learn how to do some basic moves as mm-hmm. a straight man, there's like... 75% more women at those things. Mm. It's just a fun way to meet 
people. Yeah, it sounds great. But uh, you can go to like to the Manhattan Club, mm. and it's a dance studio. Mm. It, no, I'm sorry, it's called Dance Manhattan. Dance Manhattan. Dance Manhattan. And there's another one. You should be dancing. Okay. Uh, you can just go on the nights when they have open dance, and they teach a little teaser at the beginning. So you go, you learn like, you know, how to do like three or four basic moves. You practice them out for an hour with all the other people that were there with you. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's, it's a good time. And mm. if you're single, it can be more fun because, yeah. you know, it's an easy way to meet people without going to meet people. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, it's much more organic, organic than that. Sure. But then, yeah, if you meet someone and stick with them, it's fun because it's, it's nice to do stuff like that together. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I got to add that New Year's resolution. Put, put it in there, man. coming. It's worth it. Dance it's would fun. be good. I, I do. What's that? I used to teach dance. Did you? Okay. Yeah, I used to teach. I, I went to this studio that was looking for men dancers yeah. to be partners to the women because there weren't enough. Mm. So they gave you the free lessons, and then I had already been dancing for a while. So they're like, "You want to teach for us?" So I, I wound up teaching their uh, yeah. their beginning class. It's fun. You should go. You should check. Okay, it. Um, that's what yeah. I'll get check into next because I think I would. Uh, I mean, to not participate like dance is just. So integral, I think, to the human experience. It's so integral to the human experience. And it's, I gotta incorporate it. It can't be something I do at weddings, you know, once, twice a year. It's, it's, it's good. It's good too when you, go, like, when I go to a wedding, people are like, oh shit. Oh, he's got moves. Yeah, yeah so, and that's cool. fun, yeah, you know? And I'm, I'm actually, like, in all honesty, I'm not that good. I'm just better than most people who know Which how to is dance. That's all you need. Yeah. That's all you need. Yeah, yeah. It's fun, and I can pull yeah, off a yeah, couple yeah, moves yeah, that yeah. people are like, woo, that was kind of cool. I like too, it's sort of, overlaps with because actually this this past spring I was still going to Sonic and um, I I'd, I'd, like the weather was getting nicer and I was doing both yoga pretty much every day and playing basketball nice. so I was getting like the cardio and dude I played basketball you know on and off in my life never had better footwork better body control more grace balance balance everything was coming together so well yeah. so I think on top of that if you had some dance it's just gonna be what, Dude, what you a, would just move through the city like <laughs> an apparition. You would be like, like a ghost flowing. Wow, through. look at that. People guy. would not be able to see you, you'd be so smooth. Oh, you do have to work I will tell you though. A lot of rhythm. Yeah, but yeah. I mean you could get it. I, I yeah. think I think one of the biggest things that learning to move in yoga and dance in anything, it helps you with your confidence mm. and it helps you be able to be not more energetic, like higher energy, just more presently energetic with people. Yeah. I mean, obviously you, you know, you do these interviews, you don't have this issue, but, but I think just, it makes you feel more comfortable at all times. And therefore you are mm -hmm. more potent and effective oh, yeah. at all times. Absolutely. Yeah. One thing I started, I did started like know, five, six years ago. Doing improv comedy. Oh, fun! Yeah, I'd love to do it. You should. Done. Oh, I would love to. It do is, it. yeah, especially with an acting background. I mean, and you don't. Yeah. You have to be open to just screwing up. And yeah, just totally. Fun mistakes happening, but that's in that in that kind of vein where, like, when you start doing that and you realize, you know, you screw up, you, you make a fool out of yourself, but everyone else is kind of in the same boat. It doesn't matter. You could go up to a girl, you know, go totally. up to a young lady. It's like, Make oh, a mistake. It's not a big public. deal. I'll, the sun will come up tomorrow. You right. know, it's like not, it's a nice, um, these things and yoga is one of them that kind of bleed into the other parts of your life yeah. in a positive way. It's, it's great. It's, For sure. <clears throat> For sure. And you also do uh, sound baths, right? Yes. Yeah. Since the pandemic, I haven't done as many. I'm preparing to do one soon. Um, there's another one of those things, and I say it all the time. If you told me I was going to be walking around a room with a rain stick and like ringing these crystal <laughs> singing bowls, hitting the Himalayan singing bowls, I'd be like, nah. Really? Yeah, yeah, it's just, I mean, I love music and I love sound, but it's like there's something that's very kind of like, I feel like a sprite, you know, or a, a, a fairy like floating around the room, like jingling bells in people's ears. But I've been to them. And I, I, I say this, I'm skeptical, I watch from afar, and then I'm like, huh, what's that? And then I'll get up closer, mm. and then I'll try it out, and I'll put it on and see how it feels. And if I like it, then I'm doing it too. And that's what happened with sound bath. Went to a couple sound baths, someone, uh, a friend of mine took me to, to one, uh, I can't remember, years ago. And I was like, wow, 
like I always knew about music and how it just changed how you feel. But yeah, it was it, it's powerful stuff for the simple music theory of it all. Mm. Like you hear a minor chord, you get sad. You hear a major chord, you get happy. You hear a major fifth, you feel triumphant. You know, so it's like, well, when you're mixing around the sounds and stuff, you're taking people through emotions and it's live sound, but it's peaceful live sound that makes you more reflective rather than be entertained. Mm. So it makes you kind of think and explore and it's, uh, it's a pretty powerful tool for helping people relax, sleep better, explore the imagination. Mm. You know, like I'll be sitting there in a sound bath and I'm like, just creativity, like things that, projects that you're working on, ideas of what to do come more freely, mm. just cause you've, you're creating this palette of like absorption. And I think it like, you know, there, there's uh, the science behind it is it sounds good and it relaxes you like that's yeah, the that's science right, yeah. behind it. but but i do think that like energetically i've experienced in the same way that a drug takes you to kind of a new way of thinking and imagination yeah. sound baths do a similar thing for me it's like i've actually never tried it once i have something i've told you open to doing yeah. but i've never actually i'll invite you one. to the next one oh yeah please do sure. yeah i'll show up um the what was i gonna ask is it the kind of thing where you really need to be there in person like can you get the benefits of it? I, th I think in or? the same way that you watch a live performance mm -hmm. on TV, it's not that it sucks. It's, it's not that it's terrible. Yeah, yeah. You're getting the experience. Is it the same? No, but mm -hmm. there are benefits too. In fact, I do that. Like I, I go to recordings and stuff. There are, there, I forget the guy's name, which, you know, I should give him props since this is going on the interweb. I can add him to the description later. Yeah, but uh, if, he if does... He just recorded himself for like 20 hours, not in one sitting, different sittings of doing singing bowls and you play them on YouTube and like close your eyes and sit. Hmm. And it's, yeah, it's powerful stuff. So hmm. there's not, I mean, you gotta get a good set of speakers and stuff. You yeah. can't like listen through your iPhone. Sure. You, you know, AirPods will be okay. They'll yeah, be okay. But, but I think same. pumping the sound right into your ears is not as beneficial as feeling it vibrate off actual walls. Yeah, yeah. You know, there's I'm not a big, I mean, watching musicals, not there in person, that's yeah. not for me. Watching plays from, I feel like it's too, di just doesn't connect with yeah. me when I watch. For sure. In that manner. Do you have any opinion on ASMR? Any any take on that? Because you have... I um, get it. I'm... Yeah, what's your... Um, it depends on what it is. Like, I'm more for the abstract. Mm. If I'm, if you're crinkling a piece of paper right in my ear, like breathing as you like chomp on a it's really gummy popular. bear. Oh my it's gosh! It, on TikTok, popular. people do videos all the time, it's and I'll like, top. I'll let, I'll last maybe twenty seconds, and I'm like, mm. I don't get it. I yeah, just don't I think get it's it. like you got to be in this percentage of people that mm -hmm. it works. But for. in the same way that I like sing, singing bowls, and I'm sure yeah. other people are like, not my thing. Yeah, I think it's just it's a little bit more of a niche. Yeah, for sure. You know, it's it tends to be more high frequency stuff less low and I really love the low like move your bowels mm. <laughs> type frequency stuff mm. favorite musical I mean Hamilton was mm. freaking incredible if I was gonna say like a musical that's been around forever um, I was a big fan of Jesus Christ Superstar. That's my favorite. Because. Oh my God, spit again. <laughs> my because favorite ever. It, it deals with a story that you and I both yes. know, and it was a different take, take on, on the whole thing. Yeah. And I think probably a more realistic take on the whole thing. I agree. I, like I was in want, a production of it in oh, high school. Oh, that's so cool. I was soldier number, soldier number three. That's great. That's <laughs> but great. I love that. Musical. I saw that on Off Broadway yeah. with the original. Uh, movie cast. Oh, Carl Anderson and Ted what? Neely. What? And oh let me tell God. you, these boys, 15 years, 20 years after they had done the original uh, movie. Did you ever movie. see the movie? Yeah, of course. Yeah, it's, yeah. So good. it's so bad, but it's so good. Like it's yeah, it's 70. It's right. like it's, got, it's, um, it's very much. Did you see the uh, the NBC? I did. I saw the modern variation. I like it. I like it. I thought I, I, yeah. I really like it. Yeah. I, I liked it. But these guys singing it, and now they had modernized it. Like it was less that kind of 70s twang rock and more. Mm. But their voices were still. Carl Anderson, Judas, was stronger and better than he was in the movie. Wow. Because his voice was now heavier and not yeah. young. He had to work for some of those notes. Right. And they were, but they were still round. And yeah. 
Yeah, that's probably my favorite. Mine one. too. Oh my that's god, funny. I, I mean, that's what this is all about, really. <laughs> Underneath it all, it was about Jesus Christ Superstar, Jesus Christ the musical. Superstar. It's so good. It's so good, and it, it is. Yeah, Mary's in love with Jesus. Totally. There's like that dynamic and the whole the thing that I don't think people come to grips with um, is, is the fact that you need Judas. You need for, Judas. for the story. You know you what I mean? Him. Like he and you know. Without that, Judas, that, we'd be yeah, in we don't have this kind of dynamic. Yeah, and Jesus is a little torn, right? You're kind of, ah, it's so good. It's well, and that's the thing, though. Jesus still loved Judas because he knew he was mm. necessary. Mm, mm. You know, it's not yeah. oh, I forgive you no matter what. It's you are necessary mm. to the story. That's that's pretty. That's pretty important. And I just love the whole thing. You know, Alan Watts talks about the story of like God's God's God, everything's perfect and he's bored. So God like splits himself in two and it's like, yeah. God, let's talk. And we're like, we're both bored. He's like, well, what if uh, you go to this planet and, you know, you deal with hardships, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And they're like, ooh, that sounds fun. So he goes and it's like, yeah, but I still knew I was God. So it was like, I knew it was going to be over soon anyway. He's like, well, what if you go and while you're there, you forget that you're God the entire time. And then like, that sounds scary. <laughs> but I think that if Jesus was to really be Jesus as a man, mm. he'd have to have the same doubts that we all have. Yeah. That he wouldn't be like, yeah, but I know that like, it was really hard and he probably wanted to back out of it once or twice. Mm. And I know they talk about like, you know, the, the, Temptation, temptation. And, yeah, he's tempted and all by the that devil stuff. And stuff like that. But I think it was probably a little bit more than that. Yeah, I mean the way it's portrayed, and it's it's two thousand two thousand years later, right? Yeah. So it's been retold, it's been changed. For sure. But yeah, I, but I think that that approach or that perspective of like a Jesus that you know questions or a Jesus that isn't sure, you right. know. But no, it's like we have. And of course, there's a lot of different denominations, everything like that. But most of the people think of Christ as like this steely, just never perfect, cannot be. Right. And it's like, man, if he was human, then I have to. Well, I'll take it that would one. Be a tougher. I'll yeah. take that one step further because, like, with the whole God thing, if God was a, let's say, a, a person, mm. well, you know, an entity, and I was told growing up, I was, I was made in God's likeness and image. I am like God. God made me like God. Well, do I always feel like doing the right thing? Do I always feel like showing up for people when I know that I should? I don't. Do I get cranky even when I know it's not fair and I'm taking it out on the people I care about? Well, maybe he's the end all be all, but he or she has the same feelings we all have and sometimes doesn't feel like doing shit. It yeah. sometimes gets cranky. Like to me, that yeah. makes more sense. Right, yeah. Than just like, I am all perfect and you are all trying to aspire to be perfect like me. It's just yeah. like, no, we're all trying to aspire to be the best we can be and having the negative is the only way we know we have the positive. Mm. It's the only way. Yeah. If you have nothing but light, how do you know it's there? You got to see a shadow to be like, oh, that's different than that. That's there, so this is there. Mm. Gotta have the devil. Yeah. Gotta have the devil. Gotta have the devil, yeah. Or else what are we, you, how can we love God without the devil? Yeah. Because we don't have a choice. Yeah. Carl Jung wrote, the, the devil was the most interesting thing in the whole dogma yeah. of, of Catholicism. For right? sure. The, um, I love Alan Watts too. It's no surprise that. It's great. I, I, uh, He's great. Jive very close. Yeah, that's the, um, his thing about what, like if. Uh, the gangster. If you dreamed for 75 years. Yeah. You Every night, yeah, yeah, sort of, and that's, I think the closest, yeah, if you ask me, sort of a metaphysical kind yeah. of thing, I would lean towards this idea that, yeah, our memories have been wiped of the other world or wherever we're coming from. To make it for interesting. For this experience, yeah, to make it interesting, to yeah. learn lessons that otherwise we couldn't learn if we had that knowledge, perhaps. Yeah, it's, um, yeah. yeah, he's great. He's, he's, he's really smart. And the God, I mean, the idea of, say, uh, God or gods with uh, some blemishes. That's like yeah. the Greek. Like yeah. The Greek gods are just—they're all, sh you know, shades of gray. You For know? sure. 
there's no black and white. They're just all kind of half evil, half good. And at the and, end of the day, self-serving in some sort yeah, of way. Yeah, and they're like humans, and they're coming down, and yeah. they're doing terrible things to humans. And totally. And things to Getting like, people yeah. pregnant. Yeah, it's just... Um, but yeah, we've obviously moved past that now. <laughs> for sure, for sure. Um, besides yoga, do you do any other forms of meditation? And if so, what type? Or kinds of I'm mostly about breath work. Okay. Breath work's like Probably my yeah. my end all be all, right? Yeah. At the end of the day, if even if you know my thoughts are running a million miles a minute, if I will take five minutes mm. and change how I'm breathing, I will change how I feel. Most people, if they just take one big inhale, hold it, mm. and then release it out, they will feel a shift in their oh, psyche. Yeah, for sure. So why not give yourself five minutes? And to me, that's that's you know, that makes the most sense. Yeah. You know, I think it, when I'm when I'm meditating, the best way I'm sitting there and I'm forgetting about everything else except not even thinking about sitting there. But I think in a more realistic way, when I'm just guiding my thoughts like i said my meditation is what's the game plan you know if you know if i'm I'm with my girlfriend and she's getting on my nerves and every time she says this one thing i get all fired up i'm meditating on that in the morning Mm -hmm. i'll be like so when she says that because it's a game right Mm -hmm. i'm i'm god in this game and the game is this is supposed to aggravate you but you don't let it aggravate you Mm -hmm. so choose a different outcome yeah you know, I had a victory like a couple of weeks ago where I, I screwed up on my time schedule and I, and I knew I was going to be late for, to teach. Heart starts thumping. I'm feeling shit about myself. I should just quit life because I'm a bad... I'm, I'm like anally retentive on time for things. If you'll notice, like yeah. right at three o'clock, you're doing yeah, you right. that was great. That was so great. I'm like, I'm like crazy on time. For, and I was waiting outside for about 10 minutes. Oh, you um, could have just... I, I thought about that, but I also yeah. wanted to give myself some moment to just yeah, be... Yeah, yeah, okay. Um, but it's given myself that time to, to shift... Uh, to change my focus like that's ultimately what any meditation is all about right is just learning to guide my thoughts and oh i was saying with uh with being late um i knew i was going to be late so i started using my breath work and meditation not to change the outcome Mm. what i did is i kept breathing the breath that i would breathe when i finally made it on time that (sighs) And I would just do it every few minutes and then besides that, just breathe a regular breath. So what was I doing? I was bringing about the good feelings that I'm going to feel when I make it on time. Not because that's going to make me make it on time. Why am I going to make myself feel like shit the entire time that I'm thinking I'm going to be late? Just feel good and feel like shit for like a minute or two when I show up late. And then apologize and everyone knows that I'm human and usually very on time and we'll all get over it. Instead, I want to beat myself up for 45 minutes. So I focused on this positive, you're you're already there, you made it already. And I actually did wind up making it. Oh, yeah. But that has nothing to do with the meditation. Like why suffer twice? Why suffer twice or why suffer suffer longer or preemptively? Like that's just silly. That's meditation for me. Yeah. That's what it's all about. I feel it. Ran, like a random question. Yeah. This is very broad, so you can answer. Any favorite uh, media uh, that you want to share? So things like podcast, books, TV shows, movies, any, anything like your, your fa- We went through musicals already, but right. you know, any favorites, stuff that you, um, or even like influencer, other yoga, yoga, yoga people you follow? I don't know. You know, I. Very broad. I remember when I went to school for audio engineering and we were just coming into like the MP3. I mean, they'd been around for a while, but um, everybody had an MP3 player at this point. And someone asked me like, what kind of music are you into? And I said, I just like songs. Like Hmm. if I hear a good song, I don't care the genre. If it speaks to me, I want to listen to it. And that's kind of how I go through with my, you know, spirituality. Um, Hmm. Sarva Priyananda, he's from the... um, Vedantic Society in California, follow him a lot. Um, does some great uh, talk about the Panchakosha, um, about isness being. Um, Sadhguru, I follow him, mm-hmm. kind of can't get away from him. 
Um, we were talk both talking about Jordan Peterson. Oh, yeah. I find him so interesting. And I think he says some really powerful things. Mm. I know he pisses people off with some of his viewpoints and things like that. But um, but I, I do, I am inspired by some of the stuff he says. Um, Can you think of anything in particular that mm. sticks out? Not to put, I mean. Yeah. I'm, if not. Yeah. Just when he starts talking about the whole God thing and like his, the hardships that he's experienced mm -hmm. and like, does he believe in God? He's always like, well, I don't like that question, mm -hmm. you know, but, uh, you know, just his viewpoints on that stuff, how he views society, because I do think there are some, there are a lot of truths to inequality, mm -hmm. but I also do think that people run with that and handle it the wrong way. And I do think he speaks effectively to those, those ideas, um, and it's not, and it's easy not to be liked when you're talking about that sort of stuff. Mm. Um, yeah. And finding the balance, because I, 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 I think what you're experiencing a lot, you know, with like toxic masculinity and stuff, is now people's solution is to mock and to belittle those people and it's like right. but that's not a solution either sure, so right. it's like trying to come to that standpoint of like people need help to see the right way mm. they don't need to be hated upon to see the right way because it's not going to work anyway right. so he, he he talks about sure. a lot of that stuff too simon spivek is that his last name am i saying it wrong sinek sinek oh yeah i like his stuff yeah um you know, it's funny, I think, and I hope he sees this on the internet one day, <laughs> because, <laughs> one, because that means you're getting famous, and two, <laughs> uh, because I think it's hysterical. I was, like, loving all of the stuff he says, and then he, he tells this one thing about uh, watching the marathon, mm. and his, there's a, a line for free bagels, <laughs> and he's like says to his friend, free bagels, and his friend's like, I don't want to wait in the line. And he's like free bagels and he's like nah no you know it's like there's so many people and he's like fr like to him it was a no-brainer we're going to get sure. this free bagels yeah. so the way that he uh he solves it is he goes and kind of like r cuts in line and reaches over and grabs a bagel and his argument was like i didn't hurt anybody mm. everybody still got their bagel and sure. me one person grabbing that bagel didn't change anything the downside is i didn't get to choose the kind of bagel i got i just reached in there and grabbed whatever i could get but I didn't hurt anybody and I got what I wanted. And I'm like, you motherfucker. <laughs> I would never do that because I'm way too considerate. I, ad uh, again, yeah. I admire people right. that like, they're like, this is what I want and I'm going for it and mm. I don't care. Because my logic says, what if everyone does that? Sure. Then society's in trouble. Mm. So, but anyway, I like most of what he has to say, but when he yeah. starts telling the free bagel talk, I'm like, turn this mother flower off. Yeah, I've never really gotten into Simon Sinek. I've yeah. His stuff has come up once or twice. He but... speaks a lot about like realizing that the best leaders work as a team. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> He's like, you know, if, and he talks about the Navy SEALs all the time. Yeah, sure. And they say the people who always fail are the person that going to be the leader the leader and the like i'm going to do this and i'm going to nothing's going to stop me it's more the people who say guys i need your help they're the people that succeed okay, and cool. he's like the true leaders are the people that aren't afraid to ask for help and ask the opinions of their team so that they can come up with the best case scenario they have to make the hard choices etc cetera, etc cetera. um but ultimately that makes them the best leader and i do like tony robbins Oh yeah, Tony. Yeah. He's he's got some great stuff he he has to say. You know, I know he's like people have like they love him or hate him type mm -hmm. thing cuz a lot of the stuff he says can go again the Gary V route which is like put a lot of pressure on you to like be explosive and powerful and the best yeah. you can be where some people are going to be completely happy owning a laundromat and you know, getting married and watching yeah. TV every night like I don't assume that everybody needs to aspire to the things that I need to aspire to. But with that said, I also think the human condition, we, we work better when we have goals. Mm. So, you know, for me, there's the balance. It's sure. just like, I'm not trying to say that everyone needs to do all these things to be happy, but I do know that if you're gonna set a goal, even learning to play the guitar, you've got a goal, so you have something to work towards. You're gonna feel better about yourself if you work towards a goal. Yeah. Yeah, so those those are my uh, cool. My, yeah, I think my, it's good to know people's list. influences, people you like. I mean, 
Yeah, or pieces of art that you like. You know, I think that's it fills you out sort of. As... Love Dolly. Oh yeah, yeah. Of course. All Follow the Dolly. Yeah. All the surrealists. Yeah, so good. I love abstract, abstract yeah. music. Mm -hmm. You know, I actually when I was dancing, I danced in a modern dance group. Mm. The Todd Henry Project. Actually, he wound up being my best friend. He is my best friend to the yeah. day. Um, and it was like not traditional, like, oh, we're all going to kick our leg and turn this way. It was like weird sort of very uh, domestic movements and, and things. It was dance, but it was very sort of pedestrian. Um, and I and I loved it for that. You know, oh. it's like more on the abstract side of things. Again, getting back to my dislike for this kind of music theater. It's like people are like dancing really hard and no one's saying anything. And the moment they get their arms together and kick the same leg, everyone's like cheering like it's the best thing ever. Like people like symmetry and they like something yeah. they recognize and identify with where I like, you know sort of the darker, mixed, less obvious side of things. Mm. That's how I am with music, too. I tend to like, you know, like broken down dubstep. I'm a huge fan of. Not like dubstep, like the super droney, like fast stuff, but like James Blake. Do you know yeah. James Blake? I love his stuff. It's yeah. just like, you know, there'll be like a, a football field in between two notes, and it's like, mm. it just has power and punch, and yeah, I like it. That's cool. How are you doing on time? I want to be mindful of your... Yeah, I should get going. Okay. Dude. Cool. Anything else you want to... I mean, how can people find out more about you? What oh, thank be... you so yeah, much. Yeah. Uh, Chris Temple Yoga is my website. Mm -hmm. I'm on social media, TikTok, Instagram, Facebook. I do most of my posting on TikTok and Instagram, and I do like how-to videos, try to do some inspirational videos. Um, I'm teaching... I teach most, mostly down at Lifetime Fitness in Brooklyn, but I also teach my own classes virtually online. You can check me out on my website, find me there. Yeah. But yeah, for sure. Yeah. Hope to see you guys doing whatever works for you. I always, I just want to finish saying this, that yoga does not have to be yoga. Yoga can be basketball. Whatever getting you moving, breathing, yeah. and feeling good and forgetting about life for a few minutes, that's your yoga. And that's going to be like the most powerful thing that you can do mm -hmm. for yourself. So even though yeah. I love yoga yoga, Yoga simply means connect with yourself. That's ultimately what the word means. Absolutely. Connection. And I'll link to everything in the description, all your stuff. So if Thanks, you check man. out the description in this video below, all that stuff will be there. And I didn't even get to tell, talk to the audience about how much I've loved taking your classes. Because it's been, it's been a minute, but, you know, definitely you're a popular instructor. Thanks, <laughs> you're the man. You'll fill up the class. And sure. I got to say, uh, blessed. you are able to hold a space that feels like sacred and playful at the same time, which is like a really hard combination to pull off. But you have a real gift in terms of being able to, I don't know, like, yeah, connect with everyone in the room and, and hold a space that just feels like awesome and great and like joyful and you're Thanks. funny and you're genuine, you know, it comes through yeah, I think in, your, in your teaching a lot. Anyway. I feel my strongest point of my teaching is authenticity. Yeah. I'm not teaching you like, I'm your yoga teacher. I'm like, mm -hmm. hey guys, let's jump in the pool and splash around. Mm -hmm. And I think that resonates with people. And I just feel blessed that people love what I'm doing because it, it, it empowers me. It makes me feel good to know that people are feeling good and coming back even if they haven't been in a while. Yeah. See you soon, brother. <laughs> I'll be there. <laughs> Thank you so much, Chris. This you got it, awesome, man. awesome Thanks, conversation. Man. Appreciate it. All right. Namaste, mother flower. Namaste. Yes. <laughs>